Uh, this event was started in 2001 by four people, myself uh, and the three other members of the San Jacinto Historical Advisory Board at that time, uh, which were myself, Nina Hendy, uh, Bill Connor, and Jan DeVault. And uh, we did this as an experiment to see if, uh, in addition to the official ceremony for San Jacinto Day, whether there would be an interest uh, in, the, in, in Houston to have an event such as this that would be devoted uh, to an all-day event uh, on Texas history, and in particular focusing on the Battle of San Jacinto and the Texas Revolution and Republic period. Uh, it's, it, uh, <clears throat> it exceeded our best expectations. Uh, since then, uh, we have had over uh, 1,700 registered uh, guests to our symposium since the, since the first one. We brought in over 40 uh, outstanding scholars from all over Texas, many states, and Mexico. And today we had another scholar from Mexico and a new country uh, with Scotland or UK. And we're very pleased to have a great lineup of speakers for today. Also, one of the uh, exciting things that we've implemented <coughs> for our symposium is the offering of professional education credits for school teachers. And this year we had 41 school teachers registered. And I'd like for each of you to raise your hands. I'd like to recognize you. And thank you very much. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much for coming and also for your work in teaching our kids uh, about Texas history and the exciting things that, uh, that we have uh, to, to know about our, our great history of our state. Also, we have uh, <clears throat> some very special financial sponsors I'd like to recognize. Uh, these are the Summerlee Foundation, Humanities Texas, which is the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Sterling Bank, and also uh, Compass Charity. We'd like to thank each of those entities for their financial support for the symposium. Now, before starting, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Friends of the San Jacinto Battleground. Uh, this, this event is organized by a committee, call it the Symposium Committee, which is in, composed entirely of volunteers. Uh, the chairman of the committee is Dave Britton, um, and uh, there are about 25 or so volunteers uh, whose names are in the program. And I'd like to thank each and every one of them for their work in putting this on. It's amazing that each year we're able to do this without any paid employees at all. Uh, so it's a real credit to, to the committee that uh, this is that we were able to do this year in and year out. Uh, the Friends is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Uh, our primary purpose is to help educate the public about the Battle of San Jacinto and the Texas Revolution. We also advocate the preservation and protection of the San Jacinto battlefield. And in addition to the symposium, we uh, raise funds for archaeology at the park, for restoration of marshes at the park, for historical interpretation, and uh, land acquisition, and we also serve as the fiscal agent for the <coughs> official San Jacinto Day commemorative ceremony, which will be this Monday, <coughs> and also the annual San Jacinto reenactment, and the First Texas Volunteers, which is a group that helps restore the interior of the battleship Texas. Uh, our motto is that every Texan should be a friend of San Jacinto. So if uh, you're not already a member, we'd like to encourage you to, to be so. Uh, we have a website, friendsofsanjaceno.org, and uh, there should be some information in your packet about our, our organization. Our president is Jan DeVault, and you'll be hearing from her at lunch. And with that, um, is uh, Sylvia Garcia here? Yes, she is. She is, great. I'd like to introduce the Honorable Sylvia Garcia. She is uh, Harris County Commissioner uh, precinct 2, her precinct covers uh, the area of the, of the battleground. Uh, uh, Ms. Garcia is, uh, has served on more than 25 community boards and commissions and has served as chairperson or honorary chairperson of numerous uh, charity functions. She's one of the uh, great political leaders of uh, Harris County and we're very pr uh, pleased to have her give a short presentation before we begin. Also, like to mention that we have another politician here, Tommy Atkinson from Bear County, uh, yeah, County Commissioner. Can. So, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> well, I felt like yeah, I was lost, but now I am found. <laughs> I um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody here from um, Ida Harris County. Welcome to. Houston, Harris County, and Precinct 2. Uh, we're glad you're here with us this morning. And for those of you from the Houston area and Harris County, uh, let's give all our, our friends from outside of our area a big round of applause. And thank you all for coming. I'm glad that um, 
there's a commissioner here from uh, San Antonio. Uh, he and I have worked together on a number of issues around the state, uh, particularly uh, jail overcrowding. Uh, and I'm pleased to tell me I had no idea you had interest in the same topic. So now we'll have even more things to talk about it at our next conference. But what I wanted to do this morning is not just welcome you, uh, but to just give you just a little glimpse of what we're doing um, down, up and down Battleground Road. And I wanted to, to do that in the time that I've been allotted to, to do my welcome this morning because there is nothing more important to me than preserving uh, the historic sites in that area and doing all that we can to make it more inviting and more attractive so that we can get more tourists, more children, and more people to come visit our area. And what I'd like to talk about this morning is, is David G. Burnett Park, uh, which we recently uh, did the first phase of redevelopment. And this is what the park looks like. And David G. Burnett Park is on the north landing uh, and on the northern part of Battleground Road, uh, which we will be renaming Independence Parkway. This is a portion of Independence Parkway that the county has owned for years. The southern portion is a portion that is owned, was previously owned by TxDOT, and they recently transferred the property over to our precinct. I think last time I was here, I mentioned to you about Project Stars. Can we go back to the other slide, Dustin? Project Stars, and this is the epic art that I mentioned to you all the last time I visited with you. And two more uh, tanks will get epic art in about two weeks. So that project moves forward of putting historic art on our storage tanks in and around 225 and Battleground Road. From I-10 along the causeway, we're adding basic safety features to make the road a little safer and a little cleaner and a little more inviting. You'll end up on the north landing parks, and there we'll have park space, green space, and parking spaces where we'll give families a chance to be able to, to sit down and, and watch the water and, and go down and, and have some fun. And we're calling this uh, area Lynchburg Plaza. And then you'll end up uh, going further down and you'll see the area where the runaway scrape uh, took place. And we'll have strategically placed around our area signage and wayfinding so that the tourists can, can know and learn more about the area and what occurred there. Now the ferry takes us across the channel to the south landing. We are already planning Juan Seguin Park. I mentioned that to you last time I was here, that we acquired some property, and that particular park has been named after Juan Seguin. Another next stop for family and visitors as they go down and travel down Battleground Road, uh, of course, down by the battleship, will continue to go, and as business picks up, we'll be able to be doing a little more roadside enhancements. But that whole area between 225 and I-10, you'll begin to see uh, more trees, uh, banner poles, more lighting, and hopefully something more inviting for our tourists to come and enjoy and read and learn about Texas history. Again, we're doing our part in Precinct 2 to make sure that we can do whatever we can to upgrade our roads around there and make it a more pleasant stay for visitors uh, if y'all have any questions, I'll be around for a little while, but, but please know that we're working real hard uh, to do our part to protect our history, to keep, to restore it, and to be able to pass it on. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. <clears throat> our moderator today is Dr. James Crisp. Uh, Jim is, uh, was born in Henrietta, Texas, He's a graduate of Rice University and received a PhD uh, from Yale, and he currently teaches history at North Carolina State University. Uh, he is author of Sleuth in the Alamo, which won the T.R. Fehrenbach Award uh, from the Texas Historical Commission. Uh, Jim is a, a veteran of our symposium, as many of you know. Uh, he was a speaker at the first symposium. Uh, at the second symposium, he asked such insightful questions from the audience we decided to make him the moderator during the third symposium, and he's been the moderator ever since. Uh, and uh, so we appreciate that he's uh, coming back again. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Crisp, and we'll begin our program for today. Again, thank you very much for coming. We'll have a break in the morning, and then lunch will be in another room, and we'll give additional details as we go throughout the day. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Jeff. That was a polite way of saying I was a heckler at the first, at the second <laughs> annual symposium. And I think it was Steve Harden that I was heckling, as a matter of fact. And Steve's with us here today, too. And we're glad to have him. Uh, although he. <laughs> I thought you might. I thought you might. Um, I, want, I want to begin, uh, I guess, today in honor of Stuart Reed by quoting a Scotsman, uh, Robert Burns. Uh, o wad some power the gift to gi us, to see ourselves as others see us. Um, uh, and if you couldn't understand my brogue just then, it was, uh, would some power the gift give us to see ourselves as others see us. And when we started talking about this uh, symposium. Uh, we're going to start talking about the next symposium tonight. Uh, and uh, we, we usually start brainstorming these things a, a year in advance. Um, Stuart's name was one of the ones that came up. And as we, we always try to bring new perspectives to Texas history, uh, and certainly we're doing that this time, with Stuart casting Texas history into a much broader platform of understanding with his uh, with his work on Dr. James Grant, that elusive and enigmatic person, uh, uh, very active and influential in the early and middle stages of the Texas Revolution. Um, and uh, I, had, I had heard uh, Miguel Angel uh, Gonzalez Quiroga uh, talk about the multiple connections between North Mexico and, um, and Texas at an Alamo forum a few years ago. And as we began talking about these things, we, the idea of expanding the horizons of Texas history uh, emerged. Uh, those of you who have uh, read that little book I did that, that Jeff mentioned uh, know that I am really heavily influenced by the work of, a, of all people, a Haitian anthropologist uh, by the name of Michel Rolf Trujillo. Uh, Trujillo talks a lot about, he's an anthropologist who looks at historians and how history is done. Um, and he talks a lot about the production and distribution and consumption of history. Because history is a cultural activity that historians have to look at seriously. Uh, history is produced outside the classroom and outside the academy. History is produced by, by, by people like yourselves. Uh, who teach and write and talk about history or just love to, uh, uh, to read history. And you're also consumers of history. Uh, uh, and there's a, a lot of contention that goes on with history. People arguing their positions. Sometimes they don't even, know, don't even know why they believe what they believe. They just know they believe it really strongly. Like that woman who threatened to gut me with a Bowie knife outside the Alamo one day. <laughs> I eventually did some missionary work and made her a friend. But in, in, bringing, in bringing these perspectives uh, from the United Kingdom, from North Mexico, uh, we're looking at Texas from angles that are going to reveal things about Texas that we might not have realized ourselves. Uh, Steve Harrigan, who's going to be our first speaker today, is one of those people who tries to tell the truth by lying. Uh, that is. <laughs> He, 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 he writes fiction, and really good fiction. And unlike a lot of Texas historians, he acknowledges that what he's writing is fiction. Um, <laughs> and any of you who've read the Steve's novels or other really good works of, works of art, of literature, know that there is a kind of truth that you can reach by trying to get inside people's minds. Uh, and, and, and putting uh, characters in a situation. And then if Steve, if you're like most of the novelists I've, ta I've, ta I've talked to, they find that their characters take on a life and a mind of their own and start going in directions that the novelist never anticipated. And what Steve is going to be talking about is, is looking at Texas history uh, from the, uh, I I the from, uh, with a novelist's eyes, as he said. And I can tell you, after having read gates of the Alamo, uh, that uh, I believe he achieved a truth there uh, about, uh, about what Texas was like on the eve of the revolution uh, that most Texas historians had never, uh, had never achieved. Uh, when you can close that book and say, yeah, now I sort of understand what it was like 
uh, then that's a level of truth uh, that's hard to get to. Uh, and, and if you can get that through the documentation, that's great. If you can get it through the skills of a novelist, that's wonderful too. This afternoon, uh, we're going to talk to a couple of people who are, in, who are very much engaged in the distribution and then from the, their consumers and students, the, 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 the consumption of history. Um, it, you know, you can have wonderful academic monographs between covers, and if they never get out to the ordinary person, uh, you really haven't achieved what you should achieve if you're, if you're writing history. Uh, Andriana Belden, through her portal to Texas history, using the latest technology to bring people sitting in their pajamas somewhere, right up to a document that historians used to have to travel hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles to see. And to have those documents from, it, from what, at least 70 uh, uh, museums and archives there on the web for anyone to, to see and use and examine and synthesize, uh, that's just a remarkable achievement. And most of us are of, a, of an age that all of this is new. Uh, all of this has come about even in the latter half of our lives, and uh, some of us, like me, are not entirely comfortable with it, uh, at least in terms of using it uh, in the classroom. I use chalk uh, uh, as my technological device in the classroom. Uh, I'm not even comfortable with that whiteboard. Uh, I, I'm more comfortable with the blackboard. But uh, Drianna is going to tell us about some of the things that she and her colleagues at the University of North Texas are doing. Uh, to bring history out to the wider world. And, um, and our, 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 our final speaker, or one of our afternoon speaker, our other afternoon speaker today, uh, Betsy Davis, uh, has been taking history to those most important consumers, and those are those fourth graders in their Texas history class. I've taught uh, seventh grade Texas history classes and fourth grade Texas history classes, and I love them. And I think I love the fourth graders the best because as I've told so many of my colleagues, the hormones haven't kicked in yet at the fourth grade and they tend to kind of concentrate on what you're saying rather than everything that's going on in their lives and, and uh, with their fellow classmates. And they, they're smart kids and they've, they've begun to realize uh, that, they, uh, that they have minds of their own and they, uh, they don't believe everything they hear and they're willing to ask not only good questions but to, uh, but to, to think for themselves. And um, Betsy uh, is one of those people who has most engaged fourth graders in her career as teaching Texas history in the, in the Texas public schools. And so they're expanding, Drianna and Betsy, expanding the horizons of Texas history. So we're going to be looking outward and seeing other people looking back uh, at us. Uh, and I hope you enjoy this, uh, and, uh, this uh, uh, symposium today as much as those of us who have been uh, anticipating it are going to enjoy it. Uh, when you think about something happening for a year and then it finally happens, uh, well, we're not surprised anymore. We were, I guess, the first couple of years that it actually came off. But now we're just thrilled. Uh, that we're able to conceive something like this and then make it happen, and especially thrilled by the number of people that are here in the audience today. Uh, uh, we're, we're really happy that you're here. Uh, let me begin by introducing uh, Steve Harrigan. Uh, he's a faculty fellow at the Missioner Center for Writers at the University of Texas, the author, as I mentioned, of Gates of the Alamo, uh, a, a talking head on more TV documentaries than I can count, uh, and always talking, uh, talking well. I first saw him uh, on one of those uh, over at Steve Harden's house, old house in Pflugerville, uh, and then I saw Steve uh, in Austin that night, and I, uh, this is really one of the high points of my life. I, I stopped him on the street of a sidewalk cafe, and I said, aren't you Steve Harrigan? And he really thrilled me by saying, yes, aren't you Jim Crisp? Uh, <laughs> And I, I knew I had arrived, and I hadn't even become a talking head by then, but he had seen me at some history function and, uh, and, uh, and realized uh, 
uh, who, I, who I was. And, and we've been uh, consulting and arguing with each other uh, ever since. Um, I'm, I'm going to do what I always do when Jeff Don tells me to do something, and that's just ignore him. Uh, I, all of you have a, have a long biography and bio of Steve in your official program. I'm not going to repeat that. There's nothing worse than the professor getting up and reading to you out of the textbook. So if you can read, uh, you can read about what Steve has done and what he's doing and where he is and where he was born and where he went to school and all those wonderful things. But uh, rather than have me talk about Steve anymore, I want Steve to talk to you about seeing the fact and fiction, the truth and myth of Texas through a novelist's eyes. So please welcome Steve Harrigan. Thanks, Jim. I, I've forgotten that moment. It was, uh, it was exciting for me to, to see the great Dr. Crisp <laughs> on the streets of Austin. Uh, I was. I'm here because of, of, of really one thing, the, the, my novel, The Gates of the Alamo, which came out in 2000, the year 2000. <coughs> and uh, during which time, or up, up to and about that time, I was, I was a sort of semi-expert on, uh, on, on the Alamo and, and other aspects of the Texas Revolution. That was eight years ago. I'm no longer an expert because I haven't been able to keep up with all the information that has come out. Uh, I'm, I'm on to other projects, but, but the, I was sitting in my uh, office the other day looking at my bookshelf and thought I would make a list for fun of all the books and all uh, that have come out that were not available to me when I was doing my research on, on, on this novel in 2000. Since 2000, here is a partial list of, of the books that have been published on either the Alamo, the Texas Revolution, San Jacinto, uh, this basic area in which we're all interested in. Of course, there's the inimitable Sleuthing the Alamo by Dr. Crisp. There's a, just out today is General Vicente Filosola's analysis of Jose Urea's military diary that's edited by Greg Dimmick. There's the Alamo Reader by Todd Hansen, Lone Star Nation by H.W. Brands, Lone Star Rising by William C. Davis, Sam Houston by James L. Haley, Passionate Nation by James L. Haley, A Line in the Sand by Randy Roberts and James S. Olson, Alamo Traces by Thomas Ricks Lindley, The Alamo Story by J.R. Edmondson, Sea of Mud by Greg Dimmick, The Illustrated Alamo 1836 by Mark Lemon, Texian Macabre by Stephen L. Harden. By the way, you, Steve is here. That is a terrific book for all of you who are from Houston or want to know about the history of Houston better, you got to get this book. It's, it's, it's about the founding of Houston. It's wonderful. Crisis in the Southwest by Richard Bruce Winders, Sacrifice at the Alamo by Richard Bruce Winders, Death of a Legend by Bill Groneman, The Davy Crockett Almanac by William Chimurka, The Alamo Anthology by William Chimurka, American Legend, The Real Life Adventures of Davy Crockett by Buddy Levy. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm getting long-winded here, but I want to get through this list. David Crockett, Hero of the Common Man by William Groneman. The Alamo, A Cultural History by Frank Thompson. Santa Ana of Mexico by Will Fowler. In the Footsteps of Davy Crockett by Randall Jones. The Breach by Brian Kaufman. One Domingo Morning by Ned Anthony Humacher. Folly and Glory by Larry McMurtry. Almontes, Texas by Jack Jackson. Uniforms of the Alamo by Bruce Marshall. New Orleans and the Texas Revolution by Edward L. Miller, 18 Minutes by Stephen L. Moore, The Better Part of Valor by Trish Bennett, Remember the Alamo by William W. Johnstone, Remember the Alamo Memory, Modernity, and the Master Symbol by Ricardo R. Flores, The Alamo 1836 by Stephen L. Harden and Angus McBride, The Alamo and Illustrated History by Edwin P. Hoyt, Eyewitness to the Alamo, Revised by William Groneman, Goliad, The Other Battle, by William R. Bradle, The Other Alamo, by William R. Bradle, The Texas War for Independence, by Alan Huffines, and On the Crockett Trail, by Rod Timaeus. Thank you for indulging me in that list, but I just wanted to emphasize the amazing amount of scholarship and interest that, uh, that has been uh, brought to a real, full realization in the last eight years 
about this subject that we're all so interested in. And I'm leaving aside, I'm sure, many books as well. I didn't even mention the children's books, of which there must be twice as many. I didn't mention the 2004 movie, The Alamo, that was, uh, that was a occasion not only itself, but a number of novelizations, making of books. I didn't mention the numerous television documentaries about the subject, and I didn't mention the incredibly energetic and fruitful websites that have, have grown up over the subject of the Alamo and the Texas Revolution. And one of the things that interests me is that the, the fact that all this scholarship about the Alamo, I think you can make a case that the greater part of it was probably written by white males, more or less my age, and was occasioned or incubated, possibly, by two works, separate works of fiction, and rather wild fiction at that. One was the 1955 movie and TV series, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier, starring Fess Parker. And one was, four years later, the, the epic movie, The Alamo, uh, made by J John Wayne. I mention this because everybody I know who seems to be writing about these subjects seems to be kind of like me, kind of the same age. And we share you know, certain childhood memories. And the memory that was, is certainly the case for me that the, uh, that the Crockett movie, the Fess Parker, King of the Wild Frontier movie, was a seminal event in my young life. I was seven years old when that movie came out, living in Abilene, Texas, where we didn't get uh, the channel that showed, uh, that showed it on TV. So I had to wait for the actual movie to be assembled and, 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 and put on the screen. And what was, as you remember, as, well, some of you remember, this was uh, uh, an amazing event, uh, amazing cultural event. Uh, this was Harry Potter, Star Wars, all rolled into one. It was, an, you know, it was a, the, a, a great uh, nexus of, 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 of marketing and, and mass entertainment. Probably for the first time in American history, uh, there was just this, this collision of these two forces. And what was so remarkable, I think, about this movie, which is rather forgettable, uh, except for those of us who can't forget it, is, <laughs> is, is the final episode, Davy Crockett at the Alamo, the last third of the, of the movie. And in this movie, uh, it's a cheap movie. It wasn't, they didn't build expensive sets but they had this, this gloomy sort of matte painting background that was intoxicatingly otherworldly. It just looked strange and, and alien. And, and the, the people in the Alamo in that movie, were they were, they were caught in this horizonless void. It was, you, 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 watching it as a seven-year-old kid, you had this sense of doom, of sort of claustrophobic doom. It was a very lonely and frightful place and a very haunting place. And at the end of the movie, something happened that had never happened before in my experience as a seven-year-old boy. The hero died, or, or at least seemed to die, because we, the, the movie faded out as, as Davy Crockett was swinging his rifle on the Alamo ramparts as the Mexican soldados were approaching with their bayonets. And so there was this kind of uh, hovering non-reality about that, this sense of unconcluded business and trauma that I think galvanized a generation into, into pushing their way into to a, a better, clearer understanding of what these events were. The same forces, I think, were at work in the John Wayne movie, which came out f four or five years later. And I, what I remember most vividly about that movie, A, is being let out of school to see it, and B, is, is uh, watching the credit sequence, which we, where Dmitry Tiomkin's in, amazingly lovely score against these, this beautiful matte painting of the Alamo as it, as it was said to appear at that time. Just, again, gave a sense of, of, of a haunted palace, and, and it, it, it excited my curiosity about what this place was and what all these events were really about. And that's, and again, these, both of these movies had very little to do with the historical reality of, of, of the Alamo or the Texas Revolution. Uh, they were blatantly fiction. 
But one of the things that fiction can do is can spark a lifetime obsession in a reader. It doesn't have to be good fiction. Jim was kind enough to say that my book was good fiction, but, but uh, <laughs> that there can be bad fiction that, that just sets you off on this path because you, something grabs you about that, something stirs you. Um, that was definitely the case with me. I, I was a, an impressionable kid who grew up to be, kind of by accident, a nonfiction writer. I became a, a staff writer for Texas Monthly Magazine and wrote for other magazines and was always traveling around, interviewing people, absorbing information, you know, regurgitating data. But one of the things I, I, I realized was that as a, uh, a, a, as a magazine journalist, the things that registered m with most force to me were not facts, but feelings. When I got an understanding of what a place felt like, what a person felt like, when I could uh, empathize with, with, with their situation in, in a way that was visceral and, and clear to me, then the story became alive. But facts themselves were, were just facts. And I, there, there were places I realized that fiction could take me as a reader and places where I wanted it to take me as a writer. And that's why I decided to start writing novels because there was a, the world of fact was not big enough for me. I wanted to be in there. I wanted to be with the, uh, with the participants of the story. And there's an there's a interesting and internal debate over how much responsibility a fiction writer has when it comes to historical reality. Um, not much, actually, is, 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 the, is the basic <laughs> answer. Is, if, is anybody who's ever seen a Hollywood movie knows. Uh, but it, it's interesting to sort of think about and, and, and ponder these issues. I, I was reading not long ago the, the fourth volume of Larry McMurtry's Barry Bender saga, which is this epic, uh, you know, four-volume novel about the American West, and, and the concluding volume, uh, and, and some of the concluding scenes take place at the Alamo, and in in this book, um, at the end of it, uh, there, there's a major character, Lord ben Barry Bender, who is meeting with uh, Stephen F. Austin, Davy Crockett, and Jim Bowie at Washington on the Brazos at a, at a dance that Austin is giving uh, before Crockett and Bowie are to leave for the Alamo. And um, one of the, Lord, this Lord Barry Bender says to Crockett, uh, it stirs my blood to, just to think of a good fight. Can't wait to see action, in fact. The, the blare of bugles, the thud of cannon, <coughs> Bowie and Crockett and I will go tomorrow. Crockett assures me it will be just a skirmish, be back in a day or two. The place is called San Antonio. And then uh, Crockett, somebody asked Crockett, well, uh, to explain more about what's going on in San Antonio. And he says, oh, we won't have much of a scrap in San Antonio. And she asks, why not? The big battle will be farther east. Sam Houston's over on the plain of San Jacinto getting ready. He'll show General Santa Ana what's what, no question of that. And so uh, Crockett and Bowie ride off to the Alamo, and uh, there, the siege takes place, and about apparently during the last hours of the siege, uh, McMurtry writes that, that there had been a 1,000 Mexican casualties, and, and there were Mexican bodies all heap, heaped up, as in, piled in heaps in the mission courtyard. This is before the final assault. Uh, and when the, the assault comes, Jim, Bur Jim Bowie is, uh, is described up and whirling like a dervish, jabbing and striking with his big knife. And at the very end, uh, Lord Barry Bender, he's about to be run through by a, by a Mexican soldado, and he yells at him, I'd speak to somebody about those uniforms. They make you look like clowns. This is just before he's about to be stabbed. Now, I guarantee you that Larry McMurtry knows for a fact that uh, that Jim Bowie and Davy Crockett and Stephen F. Austin were not at a ball in Washington on the Brazos, uh, you know, several weeks before the Alamo. He knows that Sam Houston was not laying a trap for, for Santa Ana in San Jacinto. He knows there were not a thousand Mexican casualties even before the battle. There weren't a thousand Mexican casualties after the battle. Um, so 
he made a very informed and I think respectable and, and defensible position that history for him was just going to be a jumping off place. He was going to use this information as he saw fit as a novelist. He has done that from Lonesome Dove on and it has served him very, very well. But, but there are different, when I started to think about writing about the Alamo, my attitude was, was different. Uh, I th for one thing, I knew this was going to be a very long book. And I knew that the readers would be annoyed with me if I wrote a book of that size in which the uh, factual elements were not reliable. So I set myself this vow of historical credibility. I wanted to create, a, as much as I could, an airtight historical background for the fictional characters that I was going to create and plug into it. I, I had no idea how to go about learning enough about this period of Texas history. I was a journalist by training, by experience. I'm not an historian. And, but one of the good things about being a journalist is that you learn very early on not to be shy about picking up the telephone and calling the people who already know the information that you need. So when I got started on this, I read all the books that were then available. And then <coughs> I called the authors of those books, those who were still alive, I called Steve Harden, I called Jim Crisp, I called Tom Lindley, and, and Alan Huffines, a number of you know, very well-known names in this field. And I asked them the questions that, that, that I needed to know based on, on, on the research I had done. I had a lot of decisions to make and a lot of questions to ask them. For one thing, I needed to create a world. I needed to, I, I didn't want to write characters, I didn't want to make Crockett, Bowie, Sanana, people like that my main characters. I wanted to, to, to come up with characters that I could understand more, that I could, that, that were in one sense or another elements of me. I wanted characters, characters who were ambivalent and conflicted, maybe not so heroic, uh, maybe not so sure of themselves. And I, so I began to create, uh, people through whose lenses and through whose experiences we might be able to see the events of the Alamo in 1836 in a slightly different way. I, my main character became, of all things, a botanist uh, because I wanted somebody who could, who could portray, I wanted to, one of the things I very much wanted to do was show what Texas was like in 1835 and 1836, what it physically was like, and I thought a botanist was a great way to get at that. Uh, I wanted characters who showed both sides of the conflict because one of the things I most wanted to do was give a credible understanding of what the forces were involved in this, not to show it just from the traditional Anglo side, but also, of course, from the Mexican side, from the Irish side, from the Native American side, because it seemed to me like a, a tremendous opportunity would be lost unless I could, I could put all those elements into the story. So I, I, I made a lot of decisions, a lot of strategic decisions about who, who to show the story through, um, a lot of intuitive decisions about what kind of people those were, what they were feeling. As Jim said earlier, characters can get away from you. And I wanted to allow myself to believe in these characters thoroughly enough so that they would get away from me, but they couldn't, the, the rule was they couldn't break through the bonds of history. And one of the, uh, I, I wandered into, into deeper waters than I thought when I was researching this book. I thought it would take me, you know, a year or so. It took me eight years to write the book. And one of the reasons was because the Alamo is so buried beneath a myth of, of uh, beneath a, a layers of myth and, and legend that it's very, very difficult, as most of you know, to get to the true story of what happened. And it was, a lot of the time I spent researching this book was spent in arguing or in refereeing arguments among historians. There was a, many of you know the, about the, uh, the narrative or the diary or whatever you want to call it of Jose Enrique de la Pena, the Mexican officer who, who states in his, in his narrative that, that Davy Crockett was captured and executed at the Alamo. Well, this wasn't just a matter of academic concern to me whether Crockett was, was captured and executed. It was vital. I couldn't say in a novel, I couldn't say on the one hand people argue this, on the other hand that. I had to have Davy Crockett die and I had to show how that happened. So I, I had to evaluate sources in my own, 
in, in, the, in the way I, I was, the only way I could, which was kind of uh, uh, whatever kind of gut feeling I could come away with, I had to evaluate sources, sources such as Pena. And Jim Crisp and Tom Lindley have this fascinatingly abstruse argument that I'm sure many of you have read going back and forth in the pages of the Alamo Journal about whether the, uh, the, 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 the Pena diary was a forgery or not, how reliable it is. But I, I had to read through all of their stuff, read, talk to everybody else, and try to figure out exactly what I thought about it. And there were innumerable issues like that. How do you, where do you come down on one side or another of an issue, and how does that serve the fictional story I wanted to tell? In some cases, the pursuit of historical truth was not always beneficial to me as a novelist. One of the, one of the scenes I was most eager to write was the best scene in the Alamo story, that the scene where, where um, <coughs> Travis calls his men together on the, uh, before the last night of the siege to tell them that all hope is lost and that they're outnumbered, they can't, they can't get away, they can't surrender, they won't surrender, and that Travis is going to stay till the bitter end, sell his life as dearly as possible, and he draws a line in the sand and asks all the, all the men in the Alamo who will stay and die with him to cross the line, and everybody but one does. The reason that's such an important element or for me was what you're always looking for in a work of fiction is a moment of clear choice where the, uh, where the protagonists have to make a decision that will, that will propel the story forward in a different direction. And to me, this was, a, this was a beautiful moment. It was the linchpin of the Alamo story, the idea of these men willingly dying for a cause they believed in. But I don't have to tell most of you in this room, and I think most of the historians here will agree with me, that this moment never happened. It was, it's, it's part of the Alamo lore, but there's really literally nothing to, to uphold it in, in, in after you analyze it fairly thoroughly. So I had, it, when I realized that in the course of my research for this book, I was very disappointed. And then I started to think, Maybe I'm not so disappointed, because the line in the sand story had always seemed a little bit more hyperbolic than real to me. It, was, it felt a little, uh, there, there was an element of fiction to it uh, that, uh, that I didn't quite grab onto. And, and when I realized what had really happened, that there were, uh, there were no grand gestures, perhaps, in the Alamo, but just maybe a, a sense of desperate survival, that there were no clear choices, but just this slow, murky entrapment, I began to believe in this moment or in this, in this situation with, in a way, in a more powerful and realistic way than I, I ever had before. And I realized when I started to think about what these men must really have been like at that moment, uh, dirty and scared and homesick and cold, I started to understand, oh, that, I, I know I can put myself there. I, I, I feel that more than I feel the reality of the, of, the, of the famous line in the sand story. And that became kind of my benchmark as I was writing this book, the idea that the emotional truth that a novelist is looking for is, is more often than not found in the actual truth of history. It, it gives you the, the tools you need, the emotions you need to, to create a credible story that people will relate to if you will just listen and pay attention to the historical record. When it comes to San Jacinto, I had only one short chapter. Uh, I had to make a decision early in the book about uh, whether uh, San Jacinto would be part of the book or not, and I decided it had to be because I didn't want to just have everybody die at the end of the book and that was it at the Alamo. So I, I, I had to do the same process of research with, with San Jacinto as I had with the Alamo. Uh, but then I realized early on, uh, fairly early on, that I could just cut to the chase in this scene. That's one thing a fiction writer can do. When I, uh, I didn't have to set up the Battle of San Jacinto. I didn't have to talk about the skirmish that took place before with Sidney Sherman or the, the artillery duel the day before. <laughs> I just had to put the reader right in the thick of the battle. But I still had to work hard to understand what that battle was all about. And I remember one memorable day with, with J.C. Martin, who was the former uh, guest director of the San Jacinto Museum, 
took me and Elizabeth Crook, who later wrote Promised Lands, her novel about the Goliad Massacre, and uh, uh, Jeff Long, who later wrote Empire of Bones, another novel about San Jacinto. When, when Jeff and Elizabeth and I decided, we realized we were all writing books about the Texas Revolution, we divvied up the battles. And so I, I got the Alamo, Jeff got San Jacinto, and, and Elizabeth got, got uh, Goliad. We, JC took us up to the, to the very top of the monument under the star, and we looked out over the battlefield. And I, I walked the ground later, I walked up the, as much as you can, toward the direction of the, uh, of the Mexican camp from the Texian camp. And I realized at that point, oh yeah, I get it. I had never understood before how the, how the Texians could have surprised the Mexicans, given that the, everybody knew where everybody was. And it was because of that rise of land, which is now somewhat obscured. Uh, and that walking the ground <coughs> was the most important aspect of, uh, uh, of learning about the Battle of San Jacinto. And walking the ground in a kind of metaphorical sense was, was absolutely crucial to me in writing this book, and I think to any novelist in trying to, to write a, a, a book that has a credible um, human emotional story against a credible historical background. I had not just to read about brown best muskets and what it's like to, to carry one up from northern Mexico. I had to hold one in my hands and see how heavy they were. I had not just to read about Crockett, I mean, Travis's letter from the Alamo. Uh, I needed to hold it in my hands and see that the words, I shall never surrender or retreat, was written, was underlined not once, not twice, but three times. When you can hold these documents, diaries, letters, when you can be in the place where the events happened, you, you get so much closer to, to what you need to know as both, I think, both an historian or, or as a fiction writer. And my, so my goal became, when writing this, no, this historical novel, was to write it as much as possible as a contemporary novel, to know the material, to know the world as so thoroughly that I could write it, about it effortlessly uh, as if these were events that had happened to me or a world I knew firsthand. Um, one of the most r rapturous dreams I've ever had in my life was when I was about uh, two-thirds of the way through the book. And I, I went to sleep one night, and I had a dream that I had been invited to a cocktail party in 1836. And I walked into a room just like this one, and there were hundreds of people there, and they were all dressed in exactly the right period clothing. They were all speaking with the same inflections, the same vocabulary that, that I had read about or, or intuited from, from the sources. Uh, that their postures were correct uh, for, for the time. And I, I had a notebook in the dream. And I was just you know, writing like crazy. It was, it was so exciting. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it and that I had the luck to be here. And then I woke up, and then I was just back to the microfilm. But, <laughs> but, uh, but that moment was, was to me, uh, so exciting, and, and to some degree, I created my own artificial uh, reality that, that I could believe in enough to write this book. Um, it was the only way I knew how to write an historical novel. It was the only way I cared to write one. There are uh, there's a school of thought, and again, I, I give historical novelists all the range in the world uh, in, in terms of what facts they want to use, what facts they want to distort. But there's, there's a school of thought that says uh, fiction is searching for a, a higher truth than history. And I don't think there's a high truth or a low truth. I think there's just the truth. And, and uh, I use that as kind of my benchmark. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be as real as I can to the facts as I can discover them. And without that bedrock of fact and without the, the participants the, in these events in the first place, who left behind letters and diaries and, 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 and reminiscences, without the historians who, uh, who, who went over this stuff so, so assiduously and, and interpreted it and helped help me understand it, without the teachers who, who have disseminated this information and, 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 and made it part of the common currency of our experience, a fiction writer has nothing nothing to, to write about 
because there is no, uh, there's no basis from which to begin. So I, I am, as, as a novelist, I, I sort of humbly and gratefully cede the field to all of you who work in, 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 in the field of fact, and, and I deeply appreciate both the opportunity to speak to you today and, and the opportunity to, to say thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. One of the great things about coming to the Sandra Sino Symposium is that you not only have the uh, ability to listen to these people firsthand, uh, but also to ask them questions. We have two ways of asking questions today. Uh, for a few minutes after each speaker uh, gives his or her talk, uh, we can take some direct, oral, spontaneous questions, something that just might have popped into your head. And Jeff, I believe we have microphones, is that correct? Uh, where are they located? On the, on the side? Is there one on the other side as well? Or just the one here? Well, there's one here. I know that for sure. Um, if you have a quick question for Steve, uh, you could make your way there. Of course, we don't have a, a lot of time for these, but we do have these yellow sheets. Uh, and these yellow sheets are here for the question and answer session that comes at the end of the day. We'll have all five panelists, if we can fit them all, uh, up on the podium. And uh, you may address your questions generally to the panelist or to one panelist in particular. And as you listen to the, uh, uh, to the talks today, if you have any questions, please take, uh, take the opportunity to, uh, to ask them uh, in one form uh, or the other. Um, I have a question for Steve. I don't see anyone at the microphone There's yet. Where's the, oh, you're right here. OK, you'll have to speak very loud, or I'll repeat your question for you. Let me just br briefly repeat uh, the question, and that is, where did we get this story of Travis drawing the line in the sand? Right, let's see if that works. Oh, does, it, does this work? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to, I might have to defer at some point to the, to the real historians in the room because it's been a long time since I've done my research on this. But it, it originated with a guy named William P. Zuber who uh, claimed to have heard it from the guy, from the one guy, uh, Lewis Rose, who claimed to have been the one who who who, was, who took up Travis up on his offer, Zuber heard it. He said when he was what is it, Jim, eight or nine years old, when when Zub, when when as a young man, and and from his mother as well as from the original. Right. Yeah. And and he heard it secondhand, reported on it uh, forty years later. Mention, you know, wrote about it 40 years later that he had heard it, and said that uh, that basically he had he was re recalling Travis's re recreating Travis's speech from the memory he had of hearing it from this guy 40 years ago, and he said I added one element that I thought without which uh, the scene would not be as dramatic, and that could only be the, the line in the sand. So uh, I think that's a very thin read to, upon which to hang a historical uh, fact. I, I just, uh, Jim or yeah, Steve this is, Some of what's to. in our textbook comes from recovered memory syndrome, <laughs> you know, which is a, uh, uh, not, a, not exactly reliable as a lot of psychologists and other people have found, but but yeah, I was hoping that Steve would mention that uh, that Zuber acknowledged that he had added an element, an unnamed element to it, and I agree with Steve that it's probably that line in the sand. Now, Steve, does that mean that Zuber is just a better novelist than you are? Or uh, he's he's excellent, <laughs> but uh, but the other, the other thing though that I think is interesting in this in this quest whole question is that. Uh, uh, on Travis's body, apparently, was found a letter by Major Robert Williamson, which was later published. We don't have the original. It was published in El Mosquito Mexicano, this newspaper, in which Williamson says, you know, hold on, basically, help is on the way. I think if Travis called his men 
together the night before the, the final assault, it was to say, look, I got this letter. Uh, all hope is not lost. You know, this is what, what you would say to people if you were trying to, to keep them on the reservation. Uh, you know, we help is on the way. Uh, uh, people are coming to help us. All we have to do is hold on. I think that was probably the tenor of the conversation. Rather than, rather than one of despair, it was probably one of hope. Were there any other questions from the audience? Dr. Chris, yes. On this same issue, did Susanna Dickerson or any other survivor of the Alamo ever speak to this question, this issue? To the line in the sand? Yes. I don't think so. Not Steve. directly, no. I mean, there were, uh, I think people have inferred from, from some of her statements that there might have been such, an, such a moment. But uh, I don't recall that, that she ever uh, said anything. I think it's all from, from Zuber. John, are you going to the microphone? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, there's another I, person there already, I think. Yeah, if I may, uh, as a commissioner whose precinct includes the Alamo, I'm very interested in all aspects of it. Uh, do you have any feel for whether, uh, I think it's kind of interesting that the line in the sand may be just a fiction, and uh, I appreciate the candor. But um, with respect to the flag that flew over the Alamo, was it the twin star flag of the state of the province of Coahuila y Tejas, or was it the Constitution of 1824 flag, or do you know? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows for sure. It certainly wasn't the Constitution of 1824 flag. There's no source for that, unless I'm mistaken. Well, uh, Reuben Potter, who wrote one of the first histories of the Alamo, said that the men fought under that flag. I think he was speaking metaphorically and, and rhetorically because independence had not been declared. But Onderdonk and McArdle and the other iconic artists of that scene uh, we'll put the, the, the 1824 Constitution flag there. But let me tell you, when the, when the gentlemen who were defending the Alamo uh, and, and in San Antonio from the Texas Army uh, sent uh, uh, their delegates uh, to Washington on the Brazos, and when even the Bayer County delegates, uh, uh, Jose Antonio Navarro and Francisco Ruiz, they told them, if you don't vote for independence, you better not come back. Uh, so the idea that these men were flying the constitutional flag of 1824, I think, really is a myth. There's only one flag that we know for darn sure was there, and that's the flag of the New Orleans Grays, uh, which was captured by the Mexican army and, and is in Mexico City to this day. But in terms of the, um, of the, of the two-star flag of Coahuila y Tejas, uh, there's pretty good evidence uh, in the drawings that were made of the Alamo uh, by... Um, was it uh, Sanchez? Sanchez Navarro. Sanchez also, Navarro. Also, there's El Monte's. Uh, doesn't he reference the two-star flag? I think El Monte also mentioned mentioned that. So, that, I mean, that's that a good, the two-star flag is a good bet, don't you think? And oh, yeah. New Orleans Grays, but other than that. It's yeah, I think so. Uh, John? Yes, uh, John Richardson, San Antonio, uh, employee of the Alamo. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Constituent of Tommy Atkinson. <laughs> Uh, just clarification on the Dickinson question. Um, she was interviewed, as you probably know, late in life by several newspaper reporters. <laughs> and uh, journalism has improved, as you know, uh, since the 19th century. Mm. It has, actually. It's, it's, <laughs> it w until recently. Re <laughs> yeah. they, they, were blatantly, they were blatantly biased politically now that it's more subtle. But mm. anyway. Uh, <laughs> Dickinson is asked several times about the line in the sand after the story was published in 1873 in the Texas Almanac by Zuber. And she actually told different accounts. Sometimes they cross the line to stay, sometimes they cross the line to leave. So uh, I think she was uh, perhaps being a little led on, the bat, uh, led on somewhat by the uh, reporters. Mm -hmm. In terms of the Rose account, um, initially it was published in 1873 in the Texas Almanac. Most people uh, denied the plausibility of the story because Everyone, of course, knew that everyone died in the Alamo. No one left. They actually uh, questioned the existence of uh, Moses Rose. And actually, in the 1930s, there was a, a county clerk in Nacogdoches County, Robert Bruce Blake, who was going back and, and uh, transcribing all these old, old uh, court records. Uh, Nacogdoches, obviously, one of the oldest areas in Texas being settled, going back to the Spanish uh, land grants, even. And he came across a series of depositions that were filed in the 1840s. And he came across the name uh, not of uh, 
uh, Lewis Rose, who was deposed by the, uh, I assume in the county court, in order to establish the veracity of certain people's accounts, meaning that if you had an ancestor, or a relative, I should say, who died in the Battle of the Alamo, mm -hmm. and you had to try to determine if they were there in order to um, receive the land grants, you had to find someone who could back up that story. Mm -hmm. So Rose is deposed several times uh, in the 1840s. That information was uncovered in the 1930s, and that's when people started to realize that Rose really was there, and then also brought back into question the storyline in the sand. Mm -hmm. So at least it became more probable in terms of Rose being there. The position basically that we kind of are at right now, I think, is that we know that Rose was there, we know that he left, we're not sure under what circumstances he left. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of, I think, the, the best way to approach it. Uh, in terms of the letter quickly written by uh, Robert Williamson, the first part of the letter says, by the time you read this letter, 60 men will already be there. Of course, that's another topic for conversation. Did those 60 extra men get there? And mm -hmm. that's obviously, as most people know, it's been a, a question of debate <coughs> also recently. Uh, just to play devil's advocate for a moment, uh, if those 60 did not get there, then the next question, uh, passage, Williamson writes, by the time, you know, by the time you read this 60 men will be there and another 300 are on their way. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're looking around and not seeing the 60 men, what chances are that the 300 will get there? So mm -hmm. we don't know for sure whether the 60 got there or not. You know, that's again, that's a, that's a question for debate probably another time. But well, uh, uh, it is interesting to, to try to determine uh, what these people's mindset were. And as, an, as a, a fiction writer, you have the leeway to sort of expand on that. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I think your description in your book of, of uh, sort of a quiet desperation, I think is probably the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. But you know, there, are, there is movement back and forth. You do have men coming into the compound right. as, as um, support, the 32th of Gonzalez. You have men and women leaving uh, during the amnesty. So mm -hmm. there is movement back and forth. Uh, so it certainly was possible. Yeah. And the fact is, of course, as we know, those men did stay. You know, what motivated them to stay is open to uh, debate. Yeah, I, th I think you're. You know, certainly open to debate. Uh, the uh, I think the reinforcements did get there because all all the most reliable accounts of how many people died inside the Alamo uh, seem to account for those extra men. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Susanna Dickinson, I I made a point of discounting any newspaper interviews with her because they are just so absolutely florid and weird. And uh, as you say, this, the, uh, the, even by, I think, 1873 standards, the journalism in <laughs> the, there was pretty poor. I, I think it was just hy hyperbolic, purple prose. Uh, I, I, I made a point to, to give a lot of credence to her 1876 testimony to the Adjutant General's office, which seems extremely uh, uh, sound to me and, 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 and clear. Uh, as far as uh, Lewis Rose, that that's a whole uh, can of worms. Again, it's been eight years for me, but and I'm sure you've read uh, Alamo Traces by Tom Lindley, where he goes into that in, in huge detail. I can't remember, frankly, all the back and forth about whether Lewis Rose was really Stephen Rose or this and that. But I, if anybody wants to investigate it further, that's probably the best place to start. Yeah, there's a, there are a lot of cans of worms out there, and we, we're not going to open any more of them just now. Uh, but uh, if you would like, if you have a particular can of worms you would like to have us open uh, in the afternoon session, be sure and write these questions. Uh, and just to explain uh, uh, in another half minute's worth, uh, these questions you should deliver to us after the last speaker has finished. Just bring them up here to the podium. I will censor them. Uh, not really. Uh, I will organize them. And, I, and if we have a number of questions, then I'm sure uh, a number of people asking the same question, I'll try to make sure that that question gets asked and we'll handle as many of them as there are. We have a lot of people out there and there may be a lot of questions, but we'll do the best we can uh, to do that. Um, I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to have an extended conversation with a Mexican diplomat. Uh, a diplomat uh, who was stationed in the Balkans before he was uh, brought back to this side of the Atlantic. And uh, one of the things he told me is that as, a, as an educated, uh, a well-educated Mexican young man uh, of about my age, uh, he believed when he was in his 20s and 30s that nothing good ever came out of the United States. Um, and we talked about how there were other people on this side of the Rio Grande 
uh, who, uh, who, who, who felt the, the same way in, in, a, in a mirror image. Uh, he, he, he told me that his experience in the Balkans uh, led him to reflect on grudges. Uh, and as he talked about the Greeks and the Serbians and the others that he had, he had met there, uh, holding grudges for 200, 300, 400 years, uh, older, longer than, than, uh, than since Texas was Tejas. Um, and uh, he was, uh, he like, like, like me, uh, had reached a certain uh, maturity uh, later in life as we began to poke through some of the myths and the stereotypes and the caricatures, his of the United States and the vicious racist Anglos who had poured into Mexico, uh, mine, I won't even have to repeat of what we were told about about Mexicans when we were growing up and reading Texas history movies and, and, and seeing what our culture told us. Um, one of my um, acquaintances who was raised here in Houston became a very uh, 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 senior academic, told me that when he was in the seventh grade and the teacher began to uh, talk about the Battle of the Alamo in the class that was going to cover that, uh, she asked the two Hispanic boys in the class, the young men in the seventh grade, to get up and leave because they weren't worthy of hearing the story of bravery that she was about to tell. Uh, and if you think that's atypical, it's not. Uh, I've talked to a number of people of my age, including uh, Richard Flores, the anthropologist, uh, Andres Tijerina, who audience people here have, 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 have uh, who, who people who have been in this audience have heard, and they experienced very similar things. It was his teacher who pointed to Andres and said, it was your grandfather who killed Davy Crockett. And when you're nine years old, that's tough to take. That's very tough to take. Um, there are few people as well situated to see from both sides of the Rio Grande all over to the other side than Miguel Angel Gonzalez Quiroga, uh, who has spent his life uh, traveling back and forth and looking back and forth from north to south across that river uh, of contention, seeing the borderlands as a whole, uh, seeing the similarities as well as the differences. Um, uh, uh, Miguel is a graduate of this institution, the University of Houston. He has served in the United States Marines. He's a professor at uh, uh, the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León in Monterrey. Uh, he is a, an eloquent speaker who is especially interested in the connections of labor and capital and business, uh, as well as the military expeditions and adventures that have both united as well as separated Texas from North Mexico over the last uh, two centuries. Um, and without further ado, I would like for him to come and speak to us, speak to us on commonality and conflict, uh, Northeast Mexico and the Texas Revolution and Republic, 1835 to 1845. So please uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Gonzalez Quiroga. Gracias, Jim. Agradezco mucho tus amables palabras. I'll turn to English. <laughs> Did I hear a sigh of relief? <laughs> I'm uh, honored to be here, and I want to thank everyone associated with the San Jacinto Symposium for inviting me. You've made me uh, feel at home. As Jim told you, uh, Houston was my home for some years. When my parents came from Mexico, they decided to live here in Houston. In fact, uh, we lived just a few blocks from here on Houston's east side. Me and my sisters, one of whom is here today with her husband. And uh, I have real great memories of those times. One of the best was of a uh, red brick building on McKinney Street downtown that housed the Houston Public Library. 
And occasionally on uh, Saturdays, I'd take the bus downtown and go into that library and just get lost among those books. I even read a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it opened up a new world for me. It expanded my horizons. And that's exactly what we're going to try to do today during this symposium. The war for Texas independence ended on a day of spring in 1836 at San Jacinto. This was the end of the war, but it was not the end of the warfare. Armed conflict between the Mexican government and the Texans had begun in 1835 and would continue off and on until 1845 when the former Mexican province was annexed to the United States. During that 10-year period, Mexico and the breakaway republic engaged in numerous skirmishes. Many battles that kept the border region in a state of turmoil. The Santa Fe, Somerville, and Mier expeditions carried out by the Texans between 1841 and 1843 and two attacks on San Antonio by the Mexican army in 1842 were only the most visible episodes in a state of continuous conflict. Now, this is hardly an auspicious setting in which to render an account of the multiple ways in which uh, cooperation developed between Anglos and Mexicans. But that's precisely the aim of this presentation. Anglo settlers, merchants, and politicians harbored objectives that converged with those of the Mexican residents of the border region to form a commonality of interests that promoted cooperation between the two races. Amidst the conflict, they established mutually beneficial relations and interactions in such diverse areas as land speculation, the defense of federalism, and commerce. And many of these relations and interactions uh, occurred in a region of Northeast Mexico, including Tamaulipas, Nuevo Leon, Coahuila, and part of Chihuahua. The pattern of collaboration was established as early as the 1810s during the independence movement in New Spain. American and European merchants, captains, speculators, were eager to serve the rebels and obtain profit through the use of boats and the sale of arms and munitions. Many of these activities were orchestrated by the New Orleans Association, made up of merchants and lawyers. I can't believe lawyers would do such a thing. <laughs> Can you, Jeff? <clears throat> this group was involved in financing parts of the Hidalgo Revolution in Mexico. And these early signs of cooperation would be repeated often and reveal a willingness by members of both races to set aside their mutual mistrust when a beneficial operation or transaction could be carried out. An area where Anglos and Mexicans found common ground before Texas independence involved the colonization of that province. Now, this process is well known, especially after the meticulous research of Mexican historian Miguel Soto, who was here a number of years ago. So I'm not going to go into the details. Sufficient to say uh, that the colonization laws, especially that of Coahuila y Texas, were very generous, attracting many settlers, adventurers, and speculators. Mexican nationals, like the ones you see here, Lorenzo de Zavala, Jose Antonio Mejia, and Jose Maria Carvajal participated with Americans like Joseph Vellain, David Burnett, and Joel Poinsett in schemes like the Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company in order to make a profit. Now, the actors involved in this colonization process, the national and state governments, the settlers, and the speculators were all following a script called self-interest, some of them unaware that forces were being set in motion that would lead to Texas independence. Apart from uh, economic interests, the three Mexican participants in the Galveston Bay Company, Zavala, Mejia, and Carvajal, 
also had a political agenda. All three were committed Federalists who embraced the cause of the Texans when they rebelled against the centralist government imposed by Santa Ana in 1835. Federalism provided another area of commonality between Anglos and Mexicans, and two episodes, the Texas Revolution and the Federalist Wars of 1840 in Mexico's Northeast provide insights into the ways in which Anglos and Mexicans sought to unite in a common cause. The commitment to federalism among Mexicans of the Northeast and Texas was strong. Jose Urrea, one of Santa Ana's leading generals during the Texas Revolution, found strong support for the Constitution of 1824 and a willingness by many to take up arms and join the Texans. Members of the Texas Mexican elite, like Jose Antonio Navarro and Erasmo Seguin, believed that centralism was a threat to their economic and political interests. And they did not wish to have a central government in Mexico City or a state government in Saltillo control their province and prevent its development. In late 1835, when they still believed that the Texans had no other agenda than the defense of the Constitution of 1824, Mexicans joined in the siege of Bejar, providing men, supplies, and ammunition to aid the Texas rebels. In a like manner, many Anglo-Texans held that it was strategically advantageous to join with Mexican Federalists in their struggle against Santa Ana, since this would strengthen their own cause. This line of thinking is reflected in the expedition of James Grant and Frank Johnson, which included Mexican Texans under the leadership of Placido Benavides of Victoria. Now, Stuart Reed, a little bit later on, is going to talk about this, so I'm not going to invade his topic. But two observations are worth making. The Texans sought an alliance with Federalists like Antonio Canales and Vital Fernandez, uh, both from Mexico's Northeast, in order to combat Santa Ana and the centralist government. And second, each of the actors had their own agenda and pursued his own particular interests. Grant had his and his Texan and Mexican followers had theirs. They all used federalism as a pretext to mask other ends. Another attempt to unite with Mexican Federalists was made during the Tampico Expedition, which was supported by New Orleans merchants sympathetic to the Texas cause. The expedition was led by uh, Antonio Mejia. This Cuban-born Mexican Federalist was part of a community of exiles in New Orleans in 1835 that included Valentin Gomez Farias and Jose Maria Carvajal. Mejia organized an expedition to Tampico in November 1835, which included about 150 Anglo adventurers in an attempt to provoke an uprising of Mexican Federalists against the government from Veracruz. Historian Eugene Barker has written that if Mejia's expedition had succeeded, it may have changed the course of events because Texans might have allied themselves with Mexican liberals. Unfortunately, the expedition was a dismal failure. Mejia overestimated the level of support his Federalist call would generate and underestimated the degree of rejection that the Anglo participants of his expedition would cause among the Mexican population. The Tampico expedition also reveals a large dose of deception by the participants. Mejia did not inform many of those who participated of its true nature. Edward Miller believes that many of the men who went with Mejia believed they were going to Brasoria, not Tampico. These men were, according to Miller, little more than cannon fodder for a cause that many of them neither understood nor supported. The merchants who promised support to Mejia were not sincerely interested in promoting Mexican federalism because they were less concerned with who was in charge in Mexico than they were with their own profit-making motives. They provided financial assistant, assistance on the condition that it be used to promote Texas independence. According to Miller, these merchants were not interested in rescuing Texas from a centralist despot. They represented an American attempt to seize Texas from Mexico altogether. 
The Texans continued to woo support in Mexico and shroud their movement in a Federalist pose until December 1835. The delegates at the consultation at San Felipe, in an attempt to attract Federalist support in Mexico, expressed in an enigmatic way that they would continue as part of the Mexican nation if it was governed by the Constitution of 1824. Randolph Campbell asserts that by this time, most Texian leaders had independence as their ultimate goal, but they saw the need to build strength before making an actual declaration. The consultation established a provisional governor and a general uh, council, and a dispute emerged between these two with respect to the aid that would be given to General Mejia, who was offering his support to the Texans after his failed Tampico expedition. Governor Henry Smith did not trust Mejia and refused to authorize assistance for him. The General Council strongly disagreed with that position at a time when the Texans were still trying to find support for Mexican Federalists. Mejia finally gave up and returned to New Orleans. Miller says that this signaled the beginning of the end of the cooperation between Texian leaders and Mexican Federalists. Despite the mistrust generated by this first collaboration between Anglos and Mexicans, members of the two races came together once again four years later during the Federalist Wars in northeastern Mexico. General Jose Urrea, who had converted to Federalism, led a revolt in Tampico in October 1838, and it quickly spread to the border region where it was embraced by local elites. The uprising had its roots in the rejection of centralism. The protectionist policies of the central government and the inability of the army to defend against Indian attacks further alienated the residents of the border region and drove many of them into the arms of federalism. Antonio Canales began the revolt in Tamaulipas and soon looked to Texas for support. By May 1839, Anglo-Texans were participating in the armed conflict, 25 Texans uh, were among a Federalist force that attacked Monterrey and then Saltillo. In September, Canales included a party of 180 Texans led by Reuben Ross and Samuel Jordan on his attack of a Centralist force near the Rio Grande town of Guerrero. This was the Battle of uh, El Cantaro, known in Texas as Alcantara, and it resulted in a resounding Federalist victory. But Canales did not capitalize on this success he tried and failed to take Matamoros and finally ended the siege of the city, which infuriated some of the Texans. Fifty of them returned to Texas, while the rest continued with Canales as he headed for Monterrey, the capital of Nuevo León. Thinking that the city was poorly uh, fortified, Canales attacked Monterrey in late December but was beaten back by Mariano Arista. Canales retreated toward the Rio Grande and the Texans, disgusted by this turn of events, returned to Texas and dispersed. These defeats did not dis discourage the Federalists. They regrouped and in January 1840, organized a convention at Casablanca on the right bank of the Nueces River where they established a governing structure that would be referred to by the Texans as the Republic of the Rio Grande. The principal Federalist leaders of Nuevo León, Coahuila, and Tamaulipas were on the governing council with Jesus Cárdenas as president and Canales as chief of military operations. These leaders sought support in Texas. Manuel Maria de Llano, governor of Nuevo León, had sent General Juan Pablo Anaya to Texas to solicit men, arms, and supplies. Anaya would inform the Texas government that in exchange for its support, the Federalists would be willing to recognize Texas independence. The Federalist leaders received a warm reception in Texas. They were able to obtain men, money, and moral support. In San Antonio, Samuel Maverick, mayor of the city, and others were active in the support of the federal cause. O'Driscoll's Tavern at Refugio served as headquarters for some of the Texan units. Samuel Powell, a longtime resident of Texas, provided the Federalists with a loan of $3,000. After their convention in January 1840, the Federalists stepped up their recruitment and fundraising efforts in Texas. In April, Canales met with President Lamar, who was friendly 
but noncommittal. He told Canales that he could continue to seek men and supplies in Texas. In June, the people of Victoria gave the Federalists an enthusiastic reception. Leaders like Cardenas and Canales were wined and dined by the citizens and commercial firms welcomed their trade. Samuel Plummer of Victoria wrote Lamar that the Mexi Mexican presence had given an impulse to everything there. Now, these sentiments may sound strange, especially when we recall that uh, four years earlier, Mexicans were widely hated because of the massacres at the Alamo and Goliad, which occurred nearby. For political and military reasons, Lamar uh, and his government had to exercise restraint. The Federalist movement was welcome because it distracted the Mexican government from its goal of taking back its former province. But Lamar did not wish to alienate the centralist authorities in Mexico City or his British allies at a time when he was trying to obtain recognition for Texas independence. The Texans who accepted the call to fight with the Federalists did not share those restraints. Many were in favor of a new republic made up of uh, the northern Mexican states, or they shared the, sen the Federalist sentiments of the rebels. Some went along for the adventure. Many others participated because they were promised money and land, which was appealing to many young Texans looking for opportunities after the Panic of 1837. This allowed Canales to recruit a force of about 300 Texans, including Reuben Ross and 75 Rangers who had fought against the Indians. William Fisher, who had been Sam Houston's Secretary of War, joined the movement with about 200 men, and Juan Seguin with about 100 Mexican Texans also enlisted. Even Samuel Jordan, who had deserted earlier, returned to help lead the Texan contingent. The Federalists had hoped to recruit about 1,500 Texans, but they did not even come close to that number. The total fighting force, including Mexicans, Texans, and Carrizo Indians, was about 1,000, and they were no match for a centralist army, uh, which had recently beaten back a half-hearted French invasion, and uh, which was now ready to turn its attention to the border region. By the middle of 1840, Arista had most of the region under centralist control and was combating isolated pockets of resistance. The fear of failure provoked dissension among the Federalists and especially between the Texans and the Mexican leaders of the movement. Arista used this to drive a wedge between the Federalist leaders and the Texans and, uh, and he finally gained the capitulation of Canales and his forces. Although the Federalist movement went down to defeat, it had benefits for some. For Texas, it gained an interval of peace. For the political leaders of Tamaulipas, it meant a recovery of their positions of power that they had lost during the Centralist regime. The Mexican government had to negotiate with regional elites uh, like those of Tamaulipas because Texas independence had given Canales and other leaders a sword to blandish against their own government. Their objective was not to form another republic like Texas, but to have a greater leverage and power within the Mexican Federation. We can conclude that there was a genuine spirit of federalism among many of the Mexican borderlanders, but it is also true that federalism masked deeper economic, personal, and political interests. The examples are legion. James Grant's project for a republic in northern Mexico to further British objectives, the slave interests of many Texas settlers, Zavala's, Mejia's, and Carvajal's interests in Texas land, the economic motives of the New Orleans merchants, the desire for plunder of the Texas adventurers who joined Canales during the Federalist Wars, and the political and economic interests of Mexico's northeastern elites. The economic wellsprings behind federalism would be even more evident in the commercial bonds that developed between Anglos and Mexicans in the border region. Commerce, commerce was a crucial part of the colonization of Texas. 
Stephen Austin was convinced that the trade of Santa Fe and Chihuahua could be better served by the ports of Texas, as it would be much closer uh, to Chihuahua than Missouri. And he also knew that Mexican markets were the best for Texas products. He gave an example, a fanega of corn, which is about 55 liters, could be sold in Mexican markets uh, for between four and six times more than in New Orleans. But the strongest attraction uh, of the Mexican trade was silver from the mines of northern Mexico. The scarcity of silver uh, in Texas and the U.S. Southwest made this a highly valued commodity which was required for all types of transactions. Through Santa Fe and later through Matamoros and the ports of Texas, a stream of silver flowed from the mines of Chihuahua and Zacatecas and was conveyed in the crude transport of the period to the United States. We could paraphrase Homer and say that the, these were the mines that launched a thousand wagons. <laughs> the Mexican trade was a powerful magnet pulling toward it many Yankee and European merchants like Charles Stillman and Jose San Roman who gravitated to the region of the lower uh, Rio Bravo, especially after the opening of Matamoros as a port in the early 1820s. <clears throat> These merchants had the same goal as the land speculators, to make a fortune. The area in which they chose to settle and do business became a sort of a middle ground between Anglos and Mexicans during the first half of the 19th century. Matamoros was one of seven towns along the Rio Grande called the Villas del Norte, which also included Reynosa, Camargo, Mier, Revilla, Dolores, and Laredo. Their great distance from the center of power in Mexico City and their proximity to Texas and its commerce conditioned the way in which the vecinos, or residents of the Villas, identified themselves between regional and national loyalties. And this, of course, would be crucial in defining their attitude toward the growing Anglo presence in the region. Geography and climate made the Mexican Northeast ideal for stock raising, and this became the principal economic activity. The Villas del Norte exported salt, livestock, and hides while importing corn and foodstuff. The annual income from cattle and other livestock was close to two-thirds of the total revenue for the province. But this commerce ran into a, a stone wall. The central government banned some products and placed high tariffs on others, and this drove the residents of the Villas to resort to smuggling on a massive scale. The illicit trade brought together Mexican nationals and foreigners some of those foreigners began to establish roots in Matamoros among the Mexican population and even to marry into prominent uh, Mexican families. The Mexicans who participated in the contraband trade included muleteers and cartmen, as well as landowners who cooperated with the smugglers by hiding the contraband on their ranches. Many government officials were involved or chose to look away. So both as participants or consumers, most members of society were involved and smuggling became quite an accepted occupation. <laughs> Through actions like these, Mexicans of the Northeast were pulling away from the centrifugal force of the national government and gravitating toward the irresistible pull of the American economic orbit. This movement had begun during the late colonial period and it accelerated after Mexican independence. This process redirected traditional trade routes toward the north through Matamoros and its connections with Texas ports and New Orleans. But it also uh, reconnected them toward the interior routes which connected towns of northeast Mexico with San Antonio, the most populous commercial center of Texas, and the Vías del Norte served as intermediate points for this trade. As military commander of the northern provinces in 1827, Anastasio Bustamante provided military escort to the merchants from Coahuila, Nuevo Leon, and the river settlements who transported their goods 
in convoys that left Laredo three times a year on their way to Bejar. David Weber has written that by the 1840s, the region had become dependent on the United States for markets and merchandise, just as in another time it had depended on the center of New Spain. But the nor Norestenses, or the residents of the Northeast, drifted further away from the national mainstream for another reason. They were increasingly alienated from the central government, not only because of its commercial policies, but also due to its actions during the war for Texas independence. The Norestenses were sorely afflicted during the war because of the militarization of the border region and the harsh demands placed upon them by the national government and its advancing army. They were ordered to provide men, transport animals, provisions, and money. Oftentimes, the army, the army simply ransacked uh, towns and haciendas. The division commanded by General Joaquin Ramirez y Sesma was brutal toward the population. As it crossed through Nuevo Leon on its way to Texas, it took what it wanted and committed so many outrages that it was likened to a plague of locusts. The demands of the Texas campaign provoked economic hardship on the population as oxen, mules, and horses that were needed for agricultural production but also for commerce were taken by the army. The increase of Indian depredations during and after the Texas Revolution was perhaps the reality which most afflicted the Nordestenses. At the same time, <coughs> in fact, in the very same moment that the army of Sam Houston was rushing across the fields of San Jacinto, some 300 Indian marauders were galloping through the ranches of the Rio Grande, leaving a trail of death and desolation. Santa Ana uh, became aware of this. Uh, the problem in dramatic fashion was posed to him as he passed through Laredo on his way to San Antonio. City leaders explained to the general that the threat of Indian attack had become a frightening reality because the garrison was pulled away to fight the rebels in Texas. 26 persons had been killed during the previous 12 months and more than 1,000 head of cattle stolen. According to Gilberto Hinojosa, Santa Ana neither replied to their requests for nor sent reinforcements. This incident placed the priorities of the uh, people of the border region and those of the national government in stark relief. To the vecinos, hunger and Indian raids were an ever-present danger, while the Texas rebels were only an abstract threat. The callous indifference of the national government made them realize that they would have to look out for themselves. The events of 1835-1836 forced the vecinos to adopt a more independent attitude toward the central government. Moreover, the struggle for survival in a harsh environment and the pursuit of their local interests led them to explore various forms of accommodation with the Texans and their newly gained independence. Now, race and uh, nationalism were two potential obstacles to this cooperation, but they're, they're kind of complex and, and I'm, I don't have time to deal with them now, but if you'd like during the question and answer session, we can discuss them. But despite the hostility and conflict between uh, Texas and Mexico, during the years of the Texas Republic, many Mexicans continued to trade with their Texan neighbors as they had done before the separation of Texas. Commerce was the bridge between Anglos and Mexicans, forging a commonality of interests in the border region, but it was, of course, unacceptable to the Mexican government. With a state of war existing against the rebel republic, it was natural that the government would prohibit trade with Texas and punish those who disobeyed. Army and civil authorities issued numerous decrees against trade with the Texans, like the broadside by Mariano Arista in April 1841, uh, which inveighed against the scandalous commerce that the vecinos were carrying out with the Texans. And it warned offenders that if caught, 
uh, not only would all of their property be confiscated, but they would be put in the army to serve for 10 years. After citizens of Laredo ignored the military's threats and went to Texas to trade their cattle for badly needed goods, the local military chief accused them of treason because their commerce was an implicit acceptance of Texas independence. Faced with these threats, the Norestenses took refuge in the contraband trade. According to jo uh, Joseph Wilkinson, uh, over 15,000 Mexicans operating along the river and as far south as San Luis Potosí were engaged in smuggling. The illegal trade was almost universal and included citizens high and low on the social scale. Lucinda Grigi of Monterrey uh, was accused of trafficking with the Texans and this caused a public scandal because uh, she was the concubine of Adrian Wall, one of the Mexican military commanders in charge of combating the Texans. Wall was accused of providing troops and an escort for the lady so that she could evade the fiscal authorities. Even the local military units were suspected of trading with the enemy. In mid-1844, the authorities in Reynosa put a stop to the patrols of the local militia against Indian raiders because they felt that the soldiers involved in these patrols would also engage in smuggling. Now, trade was a hazardous enterprise during those times. The traders and freighters who moved the goods through the border region faced great obstacles. Indians who made forays along the uh, Rio Grande were a major menace. Anglo and Mexican predators roamed over the land on both sides of the border, attacking the commercial caravans. Sometimes the freighters were robbed of everything and left to return on foot to their place of origin. Other times, they were simply killed. But despite these dangers, the trade persisted because it satisfied an essential need. This truth was discovered by General Hans Brobel, who was sent by President Lamar in 1841 to investigate conditions on the frontier. He reported that a part of the Anglo population was opposed to the trade, but the majority of it supported the trade because they could obtain needed articles which they could not obtain otherwise. Now, just what were those goods? Newspaper reports indicate that wagons loaded with beans, sugar, flour, leather, shoes, saddles, and silver bars continued to cross the prairies to be exchanged for calico, tobacco, and manufactured hardware. A Houston newspaper reported in 1839 that silver in large quantities was arriving in Bejar from Chihuahua. One trader arrived with $17,000 in specie, and it was estimated that goods valued up to $150,000 could be sold immediately at Bejar for specie or bullion. For various reasons, trade through Matamoros declined between 1835 and 1845. But what was lost through that port was compensated by new interior routes that developed throughout the period. Products from Coahuila, Nuevo Leon, and Tamaulipas would reach the Rio Grande at various points, such as Laredo and Camargo, and proceed inland to Bejar, Matagorda, Goliad, Victoria, and even as far as Houston and Austin. During the Federalist Wars, traders from the Northeast in large uh, numbers began to enter Texas. And according to Dr. <coughs> Ellsbury of San Antonio, they considered that they had something in common with the Texans since they had almost unanimously espoused federalism. Not only were there no longer reasons to make war, but they could join together in fighting the Indian menace. In the words of Osbury, they wished to make common cause with our citizens against the savages. President Lamar issued a proclamation in February 1839 to open trade with the Mexicans. The measure enjoined military and civil authorities to afford all proper aid and protection to peaceful citizens of Mexico who arrived uh, in Texas to exchange their goods. After less than a year, Lamar reported that notable progress had been made and that several thousand horses were introduced into Texas to supply domestic and, and military needs. In June 1841, 
Lamar sent two emissaries to see Arista in Monterrey. The purpose of the mission was to reach an agreement on ending the warfare in the border region, but also to establish a safe and friendly commerce between Texas and Northeast Mexico. As the commissioners got closer to Monterrey, they reported that the Mexican population was, in their words, <coughs> anxiously praying for peace and the reopening of a safe and direct trade with Texas. The Texas government was not alone in promoting trade. Many citizens were also in favor. When General Hansbro Bell made his inspection of the frontier, he found that most Texans had developed a dependence on commerce with Mexico. He wrote, most of them ride Spanish horses and mules with Spanish saddles. They wear Mexican blankets, and it is not unusual to see and handle Mexican plata, all procured in the way of trade. The views expressed by Bell are substantiated by the experiences of various Texans who left testimony of their ties to the Mexican trade. Henry Clay Davis came to Texas as a young man in the late 1830s and settled in San Antonio. He accepted the invitation of a Mexican friend from Camargo to visit his home. And while in that town, he met and fell in love with Hilaria Garza. That's Hillary Garza. <laughs> In order to gain her parents' permission to marry, uh, to marry Ilaria, he agreed to settle on the northern side of the river uh, so that they could see her often. And so he established a ranch there, and that's how Rio Grande City was born. And uh, he established uh, his family there and built a life among the Mexican population, like so many others that we know little about. Now, many Anglos shared the conviction that they could engage the Mexicans in a pursuit that would be mutually beneficial. That was the thinking of Henry Connolly, who received his medical degree in Kentucky and ventured to Chihuahua, where he became a merchant and freighter. He thought of a plan, like Austin, to channel the Chihuahua trade through Texas, and in 1839, he and two other merchants obtained seven wagons uh, Contracted, they contracted also about 100 guards, 50 of whom were Mexicanos, and 700 mules to carry silver to the United States and to return with manufactured goods. Now, Connolly obtained permission from the Chihuahua government, and he would pass through Presidio del Norte, which was not an authorized port of entry. Uh, so bribes would have to be paid to the authorities. Now, when Connolly returned, he was at the head of 60 to 80 wagons and about 200 people, including a circus. <laughs> <laughs> but he ran into bad luck. A new governor in Chihuahua uh, impounded the goods until the appropriate duties were paid, making the uh, venture unprofitable. Now, this occurred in 1840, 1841, and just let me remind you that a state of war existed between Mexico and Texas, which means that a lot of people joined Connolly and ventured into a territory of a nation whose army was sworn to combat the Anglo presence. Now, this was either the triumph of hope over reality or a sober assessment that things were not that bad and could be worked out to the satisfaction and mutual benefit of everyone concerned. Moreover, the fact that the venture failed does not alter a reality in which cooperation for profit was the goal, and it could be established between people of different races. William Neal was another borderlander who had no qualms about dealing with Mexicans, a native of England who became a US citizen. He established a stage line to carry goods between Matamoros and the coast. His son, Peter, was baptized in the Catholic Church, and his godfather was uh, no less than Pedro de Ampudia, one of Santa Ana's most trusted generals and a fervent enemy of the Texas government. Neil placed his wagons at Ampudia's disposal when the be beaten general uh, was removing wounded soldiers from the battlefield at Palo Alto at the beginning of the U.S.-Mexican War. 
Ampudia returned the favor in 1855 when Neal asked him to liberate a fellow merchant, Henry Kinney, who was his captive. Neal had a checkered career. He was U.S. Consul in uh, Matamoros. He was the mayor of Brownsville on two occasions. He served the uh, Confederacy during the Civil War. Uh, and his ranch uh, at Santa Maria Ranch uh, was attacked by Juan Cortina in 1859 during the Cortina War. In that struggle, his son uh, was killed. But despite this crushing blow, Neil stayed in the region, and his store at Santa Maria on the Rio Grande was an important meeting place for Anglos, Mexicans, and Indians for many years. One final case exemplifies the breed of men who were willing to deal with Mexicans in hopes of making a good living or even a fortune. Henry Lawrence Kinney, a native of Pennsylvania, who was engaged in land speculation in Illinois when he was cleaned out by the Panic of 1837, he drifted to Texas. He and William Aubrey opened a trading post next to the Nueces River and began an illegal trade with Mexico. And Kinney later brought out, he bought out Aubrey and uh, found the city of Corpus Christi. Kinney's experience reflects a willingness to subordinate national, ethnic, and racial prejudices and to adopt a pragmatic attitude necessary to survive in a hostile environment. His philosophy involved getting along with everyone, including the enemy. Thus he declared, when Mr. Mexican came, I treated him with a great deal of politeness, particularly if he had me in his power. When Mr. American came, I did the same with him, and when Mr. Indian came, I was also very frequently disposed to make a compromise with him. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> Each time men like Kenny, Davis, Neal, and Connolly made a trade, they were constructing a bridge between the two peoples of the borderlands. David Weber once wrote that economic interests often forged agreements between Anglos and Hispanics during the Spanish period. This was also true in the Mexican period, but in fact, the economic interests reflected in trade relations often went beyond agreements and led to peaceful and even amicable relations. Only a year after the war for Texas independence, the Telegraph and Texas Register of Houston reported that business and conditions in San Antonio were rapidly improving as a result of the many traders arriving from the Rio Grande. The traders were patient and friendly. And according to the paper, uh, they showed that they were desirous to renew their former intimate connections with our citizens. There was a cheering prospect that a friendly intercourse would eventually pave the way for a lasting peace. It was uh, because of this trade that Joseph Wilkinson states that in spite of Santa Ana, and the firebrands of Texas, an amicable relationship developed between individuals of the two countries that persisted right up to the U.S. war with Mexico. Stanley Green, who has studied extensively the correspondence of the Villas del Norte, asserts that the connection with Texas which mu it was much closer than has been known up to now. Octavio Herrera of Tamaulipas has discovered many documents which reveal this cooperation. Even in the state of war that existed during the Texas Republic, one document reveals that in the ranches and settlements of Reynosa, the Texans were being received in a friendly manner. One of the men charged, uh, in charge of combating the illegal trade across the Rio Grande, Colonel Francisco Gonzalez Pavon, wrote in 1838 that trade relations were creating sympathies which might lead the vecinos to reveal military secrets to the Texans. Another official, Jose Antonio Sanchez, wrote that the vecinos were in collusion with the Texans who give them tobacco and clothing and the hope of living without God and without government. <laughs> well, with that kind of government, who could blame them? Huh? <clears throat> the worst fears of the Mexican government were realized when a bigger enemy appeared on the horizon, Zachary Taylor arrived in Corpus Christi in September 1845 in preparation for the United States invasion of Mexico. 
His army needed provisions, horses, and mules. Some of these were obtained in the Villas del Norte. Merchants like Henry Kinney and Henry Clay Davis, who knew the terrain, became suppliers, and they relied on their contacts on the Rio Grande to obtain what the army needed. General Francisco Mejia of the Northern Army of Mexico was apoplectic with rage, and he ordered that merchants like Davis be captured. The, pre the prefect of the district reported that by December 1845, some of the vecinos had traded 3,000 head of cattle in Corpus Christi. So they, they had arrived there in September, and by December, they, they already had several thousand head of cattle from uh, Mexico. As can be seen, despite the conflict between the two governments and the hardships and deadly obstacles, the trade between Anglos and Mexicans continued because it was an essential component to survival in the border region. When the Mexican government tried to stop it or made it prohibitive, the people of the border region resorted to smuggling. When one were out closed, another opened. Commerce between Northeast Mexico and Texas was like a flowing stream. When it was temporarily halted by some obstruction, it would renew its flow through another route. The flow was unstoppable in spite of difficulties and proscriptions. And through commerce, Anglos and Mexicans found a common ground for peaceful coexistence and, at times, friendly cooperation. Our findings indicate that Anglos and Mexicans of the border region were brought together by a commonality of interests which promoted cooperation even in a period of intense conflict. Members of the two races defied the logic of violence to establish bonds of collaboration in diverse areas such as land speculation, the defense of federalism, and commerce. Trade became the major field for cooperation in the Texas-Mexico borderlands. The increasing alienation of the Norestenses with their government and the powerful pull of the American market created conditions for cooperation between Anglos and Mexicans of the border region. Whether the issue is land speculation or the defense of federalism or transborder trade, none of the actors, Anglo or Mexican, involved in these various interactions displayed deep philosophical or ideological principles. In their relations and interactions, <laughs> they were guided by what we are guided by, self-interest. They also had a pragmatic spirit which allowed them to defy racial and nationalist conventions in order to seek a common ground for mutual coexistence and cooperation. And finally, the border region, the contact zone between the two races, provided many opportunities and situations that obligated Anglos and Mexicans to make compromises. Over time, this cooperation even when fueled by self-interest, often evolved into mutual respect and cultural acculturation <coughs> with many instances of friendship and even marriage. And all of this occurred even in the midst <coughs> of unremitting violence, kind of like a flower growing in the desert. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating story, and it ought to remind us, especially those of us who teach history, that when we see those colors on the map, and we see those borders drawn, and we read about those wars going on, that we need to keep our nose in the documents uh, where uh, Miguel's has been in, in, in the past few years, looking at what's actually going on on the ground. Uh, because the closer you get down to the ground, the more you see those little they may look like ants from this distance, but the more you see those people going back and forth and trying to stop ants getting in your house is tough, as I've found out this rainy spring in Raleigh, and uh, uh, that's what it, uh, what it reminds me of. We're going to take a break. Uh, I'm going to exercise my prerogative to give this many people the full 15 minutes. So we're, we will meet and promptly begin again at 11.20. If you have questions for Dr. Gonzalez-Quiroga, 
uh, in order to give him a chance to answer more fully, we'll wait until the question and answer session for those. So we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. I don't guess it would be uh, telling tales out of school uh, to say that um, we really began, at least I really began, and I pushed my colleagues to think about it in this way too, we really began thinking about this symposium, this eighth symposium and our theme uh, after I became aware of Stuart Reed's uh, uh, book, uh, The Secret War for Texas. Um, seeing Texas from this distant horizon, uh, seeing the Texas Revolution from the point of view of uh, a man who was arguably a conscious British agent, uh, having followed Houston recently, and oh, I was so grateful when I reread something I had written about Houston and Grant and their trading elbows down on the Rio Grande uh, during that black hole of the Texas Revolution between the fall of Bear uh, and, uh, and the siege of the Alamo. In other words, j j late December, January, February, when nothing seems to be happening, but where the fate of Texas is being decided by this American agent, Sam Houston, no apologies for that dis description, by a conscious American agent, Sam Houston, and what is very likely this probable, this, this conscious, very likely this conscious British agent, James Grant, as they are trying each to take the Texas Revolution and the Civil War that's going on in Mexico and turn it their direction, turn it in the direction of their country. Uh, and during the Q&A session, uh, Stuart uh, or I or anyone else can tell you why we think what we do about this, but uh, this, this is a story that's very little told, and I, was, I heaved a sigh of relief after I went back and read some of my own work and after I had finished Stewart's and said, okay, I didn't say anything really stupid uh, about Dr. Grant and his, and his conflict with Houston. It all makes a lot more sense now, however, after having read Stewart's account of what's going on down there. Uh, Stuart Reed is a man of many talents. I understand you're the artist who did that uh, uh, drawing on the front uh, of, of your book. Uh, a, a, a surveyor, a cartographer, a military historian. We are so fortunate that we did not collide with Culloden any more than we did. Uh, he was at that uh, historic battle site uh, all day Wednesday uh, in Scotland, where he was very much involved in the uh, commemoration and dedication of the renovations that they've done and the reinterpretation of the Battle of Culloden, uh, the last really major uh, military uh, battle on the island of Britain. Um, he then flew all day Thursday, hours and hours and hours, so that he could be here uh, to go to San Jacinto uh, with us uh, yesterday and then to be here to talk to you uh, today. Um, uh, we, we've had a pretty good track record of contracting with people to come and speak to us before they win their prizes. And as you'll find out later, later that's exactly what happened uh, with, uh, with Stuart Reed. So let me, without talking anymore, now that everyone's back, uh, introduce to you the, uh, the fascinating and eloquent prize-winning historian uh, and self-taught historian of Texas, virtually from scratch, in order to understand his great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Stuart Reed. Thank you. I'll just expand a little bit on that introduction, just to explain to you where I come from in this story, why I've come all the way across the Atlantic to talk about a major figure of the Texan Revolution. I'm a military historian. My chief interest lies in the 18th century, the battlefield of Culloden, and the British Army the exploits after that period. By way of light recreation, for lack of a better word, I also got involved in a bit of family history and discovered this Dr. James Grant who inexplicably, so far as the family was concerned, disappeared off the face of the earth in 1820. 
completely vanished, no mention of him whatsoever, other than the fact that there was a family mystery. I was told he was a family mystery, but, no, but it was such a mystery that nobody knew what the mystery was, <laughs> only, only that it existed. And then by sheer chance, the flukish set of circumstances, which I won't bore you with, a newspaper cutting turned up from Australia, which told that he had been killed in Mexico in something, and there was a very frustrating tear in the newspaper to deal with a revolution and a guy called Edwards. In approximately 12 hours, I'd come across Hayden Edwards, the Fredonian Rebellion, and remembered from long, long ago that in the 1820s, Texas wasn't part of the United States, Texas was part of Mexico. And that he hadn't died in Mexico as we understand it now, but in the United States, in Texas. So from there, it was quite easy to move on to histories of the Texan Revolution, and it turns out to be a villain. It's all his fault. <laughs> the Alamo fell because he took all those men away from it, he took all that ammunition away from it, he took all that supplies away from it to go off to Matamoros and search of loot and everything else. Well, that didn't bother me. A wicked old granddaddy, always far more interesting than one who just ploughed the field and scattered, <laughs> went to church on Sunday and helped little old ladies across the road. It was great. I didn't mind that, but what did upset me, and this is where the teachers might like to come in on this, was the fact he was dismissed and just a line. That he was the guy who went off to Matamoros. He was a major figure, a pivotal character in the Texan Revolution, and yet nobody had done anything about him other than to dismiss him as the guy whose fault it all was. <laughs> so I went into it. I dug into it. And he still turns out to be a bit of a villain. In fact, when the manuscript for Sixth War for Texas was read by Craig Rowell of Georgia Southern, he produced two comments on it. He produced an official comment which appears in the back of the dust jacket, and an unofficial comment which he communicated to me privately. He said, this would make a great film. And if it's made as, ever made as a film, James Grant is going to be played by Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> but in approaching the story, in getting into the story, getting behind that one-line dismissal that he was the bad guy, I had an advantage in that he was family. Because he was family, I knew who he was, and that eventually led me on to what he was. Now, the who he was, which is where I've got my special insight, is he was the cousin of the British colonial secretary. This was a guy who had first-class contact with the British government. Not just some minor official, but to the very top of the British establishment. So what was he doing in Texas? Why was he, did he suddenly disappear from British history, so to speak, and turn up obscurely in Texas, so obscurely that he only merits this one line, this single inaccurate paragraph in the handbook of Texas? Why? Well, Manuel answered that pretty well in his own speech, commerce. Britain was desperately interested in Mexico not just in Mexico, but in the whole Caribbean basin, and it was worried about what was happening in the United States. It's easy sometimes here at the outset of the 21st century to look at America as a huge, as this great republic stretching from sea to shining sea. But in 1820s, it didn't. In the 1820s, the United States was still slowly moving westward from the original 13 colonies. It was expanding, but it was still very substantially on the east bank of the Mississippi. The west, although a huge chunk of it had been bought in the Louisiana Purchase, was still empty land. It still didn't exist. And the republic itself was new. 
In 1836, when the Battle of the Alamo was fought, there were still men alive who had fought at Bunker Hill. The United States was that new. So there was nothing at all inherently... There was no inevitability at this stage that Texas, far less California, would become American. The British were determined to stop it from becoming American. And the reason was commerce, pure and simple. British, the British Empire, as it later became, never started off as empire. It was an accidental empire. We gained possessions in India and beyond through the East India Company, which is a trading corporation. It was the biggest, it was the first, it was the biggest, arguably the most successful multinational trading corporation in the world. In the West, we had huge interests in the Caribbean. The Caribbean sugar trade and the, the associated spin-offs, indigo, coffee and all the rest of it, a major part of the British economy. The British won the Napoleonic Wars because of the money they had from the West India trade and the East India trade. Both of them, in the 1820s, were seen to be threatened by American expansion. Immediately, it was threatened in the Caribbean because the Americans appeared to be taking over. At the outset of the period, Florida is still Spanish. Florida is taken over by the Americans. There is this movement westwards, spurred on by the purchase of New Orleans and theoretically the lands beyond. The Americans insisted that Texas had come to them as part of the Louisiana Purchase. The Spanish government disagreed. The Mexican government which succeeded it also disagreed and this is where the the settlement of Texas comes in because a tremendously unstable period in the 1810s, 1820s stabilised it with competing interests which had led to catastrophic collapse of the Mexican Tejano community in Texas. They'd be wiped out by Spanish armies, American filibusters, general civil war and the appearance of the Comanche playing on this disorganized, demoralized community. So restocking, repopulating Texas was a major priority first for the Spanish government and the Mexican government which followed. Famously, this was started off by Moses Austin and Stephen Austin coming after him. That wasn't how the Mexican government, and the Spanish government before them, had planned it. They wanted Texas populated by European settlers. They didn't want Americans. Stephen Austin promised he would bring in Europeans. And he double-crossed his partner, Arthur Goodall Wavell, who had gone to England to raise the capital and organize the settlers there. He just cut him off. He brought in his American settlers, more American impresarios followed, and far from creating a barrier to, Mex to American expansion, Texas was becoming, if you like, the plug hole. It was drawing in the Americans, which was the last thing that the Mexicans wanted. It was also the last thing that the British wanted. They were looking at the maps. Florida had gone. There was uncomfortable interest being ex openly expressed in America in the island of Cuba. If Cuba went, that was it. The Caribbean basin had gone. It was strongly hinted to the US government any attempt to invade Cuba, any attempt to filibuster Cuba, would be strongly resisted by Britain, by France, by Spain. That was out. But movement along the Gulf Coast, that also had to be stopped. And this is where Britain came in again. Immediately to protect the Caribbean, but also looking towards India. 
because at this period, the only way to India was down through the South Atlantic, round the Cape of Good Hope of South Africa, up to India, and out to China that way. We had a succession of way stations. We, that was a well-traveled route, well-policed by the Royal Navy and the East India Company's own forces. America at this stage was not a threat to the Indian Chinese trade. But get the Americans to California, it's six weeks sail across the Pacific, different matter entirely. So for purely commercial reasons rather than political reasons, we were not keen to see America moving west to the Mississippi. And so, as they say, the adventure began. Right from the beginning, British agents, British diplomats in Mexico are working against American expansion. The big priority was to create this barrier. Texas, because it's been so pop depopulated, was merged in the new federal constitution of 1824 with Korea. The government of Korea were the people who primarily were charged with giving out these land grants, these empresario grants. But the Mexican government had a total ban on any land grants in the border area. Anything in semi-disputed area across the Sabine, the Cohia government was not allowed to make any land grants there. Any land grants there were province entirely of the central government. And so the British tried to get their own plantations there through Arthur Wavell, who had been double-crossed by Austin earlier. The Cherokees came into it, John Don Hunter, and so on. There was this plan to set up a series of impresario grants along the Sabine up the Red River, which would form a barrier between the Mexican grants, which were given to Austin and the others, and the United States itself. And which is where the Fredonian business came in, because that in itself was not a British idea, but it's one that we latched onto. We encouraged the Edwards. We encouraged them with promises of British support. And this is where Grant, who'd already been in the area for some time now, always finding excuses why he wasn't going to settle in Texas. I'm coming, uh, well, actually, I'm a bit busy. I'll come next year. But he's building up contacts all over the southern part of Texas, the trade routes along the Camino Real. He's got that figured because the one thing which is obsessing Britain at this time are the silver mines in northern Mexico. For the moment, we want to stop the Americans moving over, but we also want to make sure that this silver trade, which Miguel has been talking about, was not diverted up the Camino Real through Beja and on to the United States. We wanted it coming out through the ports, through Tampico, into the Caribbean. Into, we wanted not necessarily to corner the trade, we just didn't want the Americans cornering the trade. And so it was important to set up this barrier between to an easy commerce between the United States and Mexico through Texas. And so James Grant turns up in Texas once again during this period. We've got British diplomat Henry Ward, who was a British spy master in the area at the time, decides he's going to take this casual visit to view the silver mines. Suddenly, for some strange reason, which he never reveals in his official correspondence or in his later book, Mexico in 1827, just as it's floating about in what is now the border, the Rio Grande area, the Fredonian Rebellion starts. He's got nothing to do. He doesn't even mention it. He mentions a coup, an attempted coup in Mexico City. The rebellion, the Fredonian Rebellion around Nacogdoches, not a whisper. James Grant's there. He's referred to by one of the colonists. He is trying to find out for Austin what's going on. Says, well, Wavell and Hunter are promising British support. And there's this doctor somebody in the area who speaks French, he speaks Spanish, 
he's promising British support again. This is what it's all about. It's nothing to do with the Edwards. It's the, the British are doing it. And it collapses. We didn't get there in time. We didn't get those 500 men landed at the mouth of the Brazos, which had been promised. And Grant disappears from Texas history. Up until that point, he's in every year, he's in twice a year, trading, talking, and suddenly it goes quiet. He goes back to northern Mexico. He establishes himself in Cohia. He becomes a man of business. And he becomes deeply involved in Mexican politics, in Federalist politics. Up until that point, there is no doubt he is working as a British agent. After that point, his priorities change. It's a bit like the old rule of thumb with diplomats. I can't remember the, the exact figure, but it's generally reckoned that an ambassador to a particular country is only good for three years. For those three years, he will represent his country honestly to the government of that country, of the country he is created as an ambassador. After three years, he starts taking the side of that country against his own. He spends more time explaining, excusing why that country is acting as it does instead of laying down the law saying, no, you mustn't do that, this, that's the way we want, we object to you taking this policy. Instead, he's explaining that policy to his own government. By the 1830s, Grant has definitely moved into the Mexican side of things. He is talking as a Mexican Federalist. His input into the Texan Revolution is as a Mexican Federalist. Now, as an added bonus, what he's planning to do, what he's involved in, will still achieve that original aim of blocking the American expansion into Texas. But that is now a secondary aim in his primary aim, which is that of setting up the Republic of Rio Grande five years before Canales and the rest, and the rest actually got going on that themselves. Miguel spoke earlier of the Tampico expedition. That was not isolated. It was part of a coordinated attempt to raise the northern Mexican states, of which Texas was only a part. There is a letter from George Fisher, who was actually a Serbian called George Fisher, <laughs> who was prominent in Federalist politics, he became part of the group in New Orleans. And he set out the plan clearly in a letter to Austin. So what's going to happen is Grant has been arrested, not to do with land speculation, nothing like that, but because he was secretary, acting secretary of the Korea legislature. He's fought in Zacatecas against Santa Ana. He commanded the Korea militia against General Kors. And when that all collapsed, he and Vaiska were arrested, taken to Monterey. The plan, as the Texans revolted and started to lay siege to Beja, was that Mejia would land at Tampico or Matamoros, whichever he found convenient. It turned out to be Tampico, but that's neither here nor there. At the same time, Grant was going to be sprung from Monterey and brought back with Mejia, with uh, Vaiska, to form a new administration in Bejar. It was all part of one coherent plan. Ben Milam got involved in this too. He, he, was, the, he was the canary, so to speak. <laughs> he was allowed to escape from Monterey, where he was held with Grant and Vaiska, Cameron and various others, for two reasons. One, to check that the route was clear, and two, to create the impression that Monterey was no longer secure. He made his famous escape, aided, it's quite openly admitted, by the authorities in Monterey, and immediately, oh dear, we can't have this, Monterey is no longer secure, let's move Grant and Vesca to San Juan Holoa, down at 
Veracruz, a big island fortress. Let's lock them away there in the dungeon, toss away the key. That's, that'll solve that one. Let's get on, then let's get on the Texians. The trouble was, it was all a setup. Grant Weisker, released from prison in Monterey, sent off with a military escort who went 10 miles down the road and changed sides. They said, no, we're not centralists, no, we're federalists. Uh, the important figure here was a Mexican colonel called Jose Gonzalez, Jose Maria Gonzalez. But quite coincidentally, it was the same name as the trumpeter who sounded the attack on the Alamo some months later, but they weren't related, so far as I know. Colonel Gonzalez changed sides halfway down the road. They turned around, and the whole lot ran for Texas. Unfortunately, the Tampico expedition had failed, but Vasca, who was the president of the... Yeah, President Cohere, he got away, Grant got away, they got up to Texas and ran into trouble. Because the Texans, in particular Philip Dimmitt, were starting to look very suspiciously at the Mexicans. They were starting to think, we can do this on our own. What we want is a English-speaking republic, an American republic in Texas. We don't want to get involved in this Mexican civil war which is brewing there. We've seen Zacatecas worked over by Santa Ana. We've seen Cahuilla worked over by Cos. We can't trust the Mexicans. They're not going to stand up. To it. We're going to stand alone. Vasca goes off. He tries to enlist the support. Gets nowhere. Grant doesn't bother. He goes straight up to Behar and gets involved. He helps to take Behar. There's a revealing passage in... Some years later, there's a guy called Ogilvy who was sent out by Grant's executors to try and recover a quite remarkable amount of money which went missing at this period and some other things which we don't have time to talk about here. I can speak about it later. And he had a conversation with some of the guys who were involved in the storming of Behar. And this story we have of Ben Milam striding out and saying, who will follow me, drawing a line in the sand, which sounds suspicious like the same one that happened at the Alamo, saying, those are going to follow me into Behar, cross this line and let's go do it. What turns out was that Ben Milam was pushed out of the tent by James Grant. which is one of the reasons why Grant ended up as one of the co-leaders of the actual assault on Behar. He got himself wounded. We don't know the circumstances. If anybody can ever turn up an account of how he got himself shot in the siege of Behar, I will stand him a coffee, and two coffees, and maybe even stand him breakfast and dinner combined. I would dearly love to know. But either way, Grant got wounded during the storming of Behar, and this gave him a critical advantage later on because he f had fought, he had bled in the cause. So when later he came up against Sam Houston, who was, late, who was described by, as Grant's bitter enemy, Grant had that advantage because right up until the day of San Jacinto, Sam Houston never heard nor far less fired a shot in anger in the defence of Texas. He was a general, but he didn't fight up until they got to San Jacinto. Grant, on the other hand, did, and he had the scars to prove it. Which is where we come to Matamoros. The accounts which I read when I... The first book where I found James Grant and Steve Harden will smile at this because we were talking about that book earlier on this morning, it was a book published by Osprey, which was published just in time for the sesquicentennial, Alamo and the Texas Revolution, and it was basically a primer. It had some nice pictures. It had some hilarious colour illustrations, which I'll tell you about later at some point. And it had this one line about how Grant had led a portion of the army off to Matamoros 
and disaster. Nothing more. That was it. It was great. I sat there in the Kentucky Fried Chicken leading. That's him. Wow. But that was all it said. And little more could I find other than that, that, that somehow after taking Behar, the Texians had fallen out amongst themselves. And the story developed a bit more from that. Now, <coughs> the council had fallen out with the governor and how each of them had commissioned different people to command, how there were three, four different commanders for the Matamoros expedition, all of them in disagreement, and how eventually they'd ended up just casually stealing horses down beyond San Patricio until finally they'd got snapped up, and how much of a waste all of this had been. In actual fact, the Matamoros expedition had nothing whatsoever to do with taking Matamoros, with plundering Matamoros, or any of the other things which Houston later charged. Matamoros was only to be the trigger. Matamoros, once the Texians arrived, was to be the start of this great uprising in northern Mexico. Vital Fernandez, Canales, all those other Federalist leaders whom Miguel talked about, they had pledged themselves that when the Texians arrived at Matamoros, they would rise up. Now, had this happened, the whole history of the Texian Revolution and American history would have changed because nothing is certain in this life. Santa Ana may still have won. The revolution in northern Mexico may still have fizzled out as it did in the 1840s. On the other hand, the Republic of Rio Grande could have become a reality. There could have been this big Anglo-Mexican state encompassing a good third of the, what, the present day United States. Not just Texas, but New Mexico, Arizona, California would all have been part of this great republic of northern Mexico. Think then about how the United States would have looked, how the Civil War would have panned out, how World War I, how World War II would have panned out with a smaller, more insular United States. And it could have happened. It didn't happen, but that's what it was all about. That's what Matamoros was all about. And it was sabotaged first by Houston and then by the Mexicans themselves. Houston didn't want the army going off. Houston wasn't interested in Behar. All the way through the initial stages of the Texan Revolution, he wanted the army pulled back beyond the Colorado. It seems clear, looking at the distribution of the population <coughs> at the time, that what Houston was aiming for was an independent Texas ready for annexation by the United States, and this would come about more easily if it just included the departments of Brazos and Nagadoches, the predominantly Anglo departments. It could see that this would be easier to accomplish if he left off the Tejano Behar department. He didn't want, he had almost paranoid objection to having anything to do with the Tejano side of it, with the Mexican side. Let's leave them to it. He wanted to pull back behind the Colorado. So going to Matamoros, whether he understood fully what Grant was trying to achieve, I don't know. I suspect he did. He wanted Matamoros to stop, not because it was diversion of resources. He did not want this Anglo-Mexican state to forestall the American expansion westwards. And so he tried to get it stopped. He was only partially successful. But nevertheless, and this is one of the things which is so easily overlooked in this, when we look at the popular history of the Texan Revolution, we think of the Alamo and the retreat, the runaway scrape to San Jacinto. How many people in this hall realize that Texian troops were actually raiding across the Rio Grande before that happened. 
Apart from those who read you, would you stick your hand up if you knew that? If you knew the Texian troops were over the Rio Grande <laughs> fighting there, it wasn't a passive thing. We were reaching out, or Grant was reaching out to his Federalist friends in northern Mexico, trying to get this. That's what the Matamoros expedition was about. And that was why, when the Matamoros expedition failed, that this breach occurred between the American side and the Mexican side. Texas became a republic for the next 10 years, an independent state in its own right. Britain supported that republic. We tried, we failed to tie Texas into the greater Republic of Northern Mexico, Republic of Rio Grande. We hoped we could stop you getting hold of Texas as in the United States. We made a pretty good try at it. At one stage, the Texan minister in London was a British agent called William Kennedy. And you can't get much more infiltrated than that. But it's a fascinating story. And if you look beyond the walls of the Alamo, there's a huge, untapped, still untapped history of Texas waiting for you out there. And at that point, I'll wind up. But if you have any quick questions, deeper questions for later, I'll be pleased to speak. I don't mind. We have about five minutes uh, for a quick question for Stuart Reed. Uh, yes, what Dave. What happened to Maria Guadalupe Reyes and the children? What the, uh, let's repeat the questions. Uh, he's asking what happened to Guadalupe Maria Reyes, who was Grant's common law wife in, Tex in Mexico. The short answer is I don't know. I would dearly love to know because it, there are a lot of my relatives down there in Mexico. Grant was a rich man. One of the criticisms levelled against him by Houston was that he was merely a land speculator. By any standard in those days, Grant was rich. He had extensive haciendas. Industri he was, his hacienda was a hacienda de los hornos. He had iron smelting. He was vineyards, grain. He was a big businessman. He lost a lot by going to Texas. He'd it, the land speculation was merely insurance against all this. There was a big fortune there which he tried to secure for Guadalupe Reyes. It was seized by the authorities, but what happened after that, I don't know. I would dearly love to know what happened to it and to the children. Yeah, the, James Fannin was one of those who was going to go to Matamoros. One of the things I go into the, in the book in great detail, because it's not been properly looked at before, is the sequence of events and the sequence of command appointments on the Matamoros expedition. Grant was never officially in charge of the Matamoros expedition Unofficially, he was the man who was leading it. The man appointed to lead the Matamoros expedition was Sam Houston. Sam Houston didn't want to do it. He ordered Jim Bowie to do it. Jim Bowie had moved back to Behar before the orders caught up with him. So Fannin was ordered to take command. Johnson, who was working with Grant, is sometimes cited as being ordered to take command, but he wasn't. All he was ordered to do was take command of the Behar contingent and march them to a rendezvous with Fannin and to act under Fannin's orders. The actual command sequence was straightforward. It just got screwed up by Houston and by later historians following Houston's cue, trying to take Smith's part in this dispute between the council and the president. But it's all the same expedition. Were, were, was Sam Houston physically present with Fannin and Johnson and Grant, wherever that was, where they were making this decision? 
the, the question is, was Sam Houston physically present down there with Grant and Fannin and the others? Yes, but not with Fannin. Fannin was late in getting there. He, he had to assemble. There were a large contingent of troops coming from the United States, which he had to pick up at Velasco and ship down the coast to Copano. The troops who marched overland from Behar were met at Goliad by Sam Houston. He marched with them as far as Refugio and there addressed them, trying to stop them going further. Fortuitously for him, Grant was absent. Grant had gone down south. I mentioned before about Colonel Jose Maria Gonzalez. Gonzalez was partially responsible for cost surrender at Behar because Gonzalez was a Federalist, and he basically said to Cost men, come and join us. It's not just not what you've been told. It's not just these loudmouthed Americanos. We are Federalists out here too. And in a quite incredible evening, a large part of Cost cavalry defected to Gonzalez. It was after this defection that Cost decided he had had enough he could no longer rely on his troops because they were defecting to the Federalistas outside Behar that he then surrendered. Gonzalez then went south with a composite regiment he'd put together, partly of his own men, partly of Federalistas like Benavides, and partly of these men who defected from Koth. Grant went down to try and make contact with Gonzalez, who was floating about outside Matamoros with Canales, and while he was away, Houston tried to stop the army. He tried to get them to turn back, and, but the best he could manage was to get them to stop at Refurio to wait for Fannin, although a large contingent, upwards of 60, went off with Grant in the end. How many were actually involved is one of these interesting points. Someone spoke earlier, about, Steve Harrigan mentioned earlier, this is good evidence of 250 defenders of the Alamo. Whereas Houston and everyone taking a cue from him has mentioned this figure of 187 or occasionally 189 gets mentioned. There is a crucial and all too often overlooked reference by Houston to this 187, he refers to them as 187 white men. He ignores the Tejanos. There may well have been 250 defenders of the Alamo, but only 187 of them were white Americans. The same goes with the Grant expedition. We're frequently told in the standard version of history that when he was ambushed at Agua Dulce, he had only 26 men with him. Orea's account and some of the other Mexican accounts quite clearly state there were 60. The discrepancy is made up with Tejanos, with Federalist Mexicans, who have been written out of the story. It was a much bigger, much more integrated army than has been created. Over the course of history since 1836, the Tejanos have been written out of the Mexican Revolution. We only hear about the Americans. We only hear about these 187, which in itself is an interesting thing, because if you look at the roll call for the Alamo, Amelia Williams' work and Bill Groneman's work after worked around this 189, this 187, and they included in those the known Tejanos. But if you take out those Tejanos, there are a number of vacancies to be filled. <laughs> and I'm getting... Interesting hand signals, which I don't think are Masonic from Jim here, so I'll wind up there. Yes. If you want to ask anything further, fill out your yellow slips and we'll talk about some this afternoon. Uh, it's going to take a great exercise of self-discipline on my part not to keep this going right now because he's really getting good and I want to talk about this stuff too. But please thank uh, Stuart Reed. Uh, we... 
We'll have more of an opportunity to answer your questions. If you came in late, remember that at the end of our last two, uh, after our final two speakers this afternoon, but before the question and answer session, if you will bring your yellow sheets with your questions and answers up to the podium, I will attempt uh, to manage them and to channel your questions to these, uh, to these speakers, and we'll have all five people uh, doing Q&A. Don't forget, if you need your book signed by Dr. Demick, the new book on Philosola, he'll be around during the lunch break, but not in the afternoon. Uh, and if you want to get the autograph, do that. And at this point, I will uh, ring the dinner bell. <laughs>